Hello and welcome. In this video, we shall take a look at what is a cipher algorithm and what is a key. So till now, we have actually been discussing that whenever you need to send your original data, original text, you always encrypt it and the other end you need to decrypt it. And we also said that you need to use a specific encryption algorithm and then you decrypt using the same algorithm, right? But the question arises, what actually is a cipher algorithm? So it's pretty simple. Always remember there are only two things when you are talking in terms of cryptography. You need to know your algorithm, which is we call the cipher algorithm, and you need to get an understanding of a key. Right. So cipher algorithm is nothing but it's a cryptographic algorithm, which is a mathematical function, which is used to encrypt and decrypt the data. So I think I told you previously as well, the the base or the foundation to all these encryption algorithms or cipher algorithms is mathematics. So when we will take a look at different algorithms like RSA algorithm, Defi Hellman elliptical curve, you'll see they are nothing but a set of steps that you need to follow and these are actually mathematical set of steps right so uh, that is what it says that it is a mathematical function which is used to encrypt and decrypt data now um, because it's an algorithm and if, if going again by the root word algorithm it's it's nothing but uh, it's a set of steps or set of rules we can call it right so it is a set of rules uh, or steps uh, that define uh, how the data is transformed into ciphertext, right? So these are the rules that you use to convert, uh, say, a uh, plain text into ciphertext, which is called the encrypted text. And then because you have to convert it back into its original form, so you need to use the same algorithm and then bring it back into its original form, but it is used based on the secret key right or, or or the or the keys uh, keys that we discussed <clears throat> but what exactly is the key now you might ask what is a key right so a key is a piece of uh, information that is used as input to the cipher algorithm very important guys so we are talking about algorithm and keys so algorithm is nothing but your set of steps set of mathematical steps and key is nothing but an input to that. Now, if you if you might imagine, if you, if you can now think that what would actually be an input to a mathematical uh, formula, it would definitely be numbers, right? So normally, what what we do is we always consider, uh, or most of the time, consider large prime numbers. So we are not talking prime numbers like taking number three, number five as my keys. They are really, really large prime numbers, uh, which are used as keys, right? So it clearly says the key is a piece of information that is used as an input to the cipher algorithm, along with the plain text or cipher text to perform the encryption or decryption process, right? It is a secret value. So as I said, a key, you shouldn't be telling your key, it should be close to your heart. You shouldn't be telling your key to anybody, right? If it is a, public private key pair, public key can be shared, but secret key here, we are talking about the secret key or the private key, that only the sender and the intended recipient should know about that secret key, right? And that's where we looked at a lot of examples where we saw where Joy and Aileen had to talk to each other and they were using a combination of their own public private key pairs, right? And as we said, it must be kept secure to ensure the security of the communication so that no man in the middle comes or, or no attacker uh, actually comes uh, in the middle, right? So now you might ask that, okay, what are the best examples? So there, there are quite a few common examples of a cipher algorithm. These are DSA, SHA-3, SHA-3 with 256 and SHA-1 with DSA. And, and we will study some of these as well. But for the moment, what we need to understand is when we are talking about cryptography, the two key elements or the two major elements or artifacts for cryptography is a cipher algorithm and the input that goes to the cipher algorithm is a key, right? Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. After getting a good understanding of what is a cipher algorithm and what is a key, it's time to take a look at different algorithms, right? So as we studied there in cryptography, there is asymmetric encryption and there is symmetric encryption, right? So we'll, we'll do the same way. So because we studied symmetric encryption first, 
So we will talk about various symmetric key algorithms that are available in the market or they or that have been available uh, in the market per se. So the key um, uh, algorithms are DES and AES. So first we will understand what is DES. So DES stand for data encryption standard, right? So data encryption standard is basically a symmetric key algorithm. Very uh, important thing to notice here is it is a symmetric key, right? It is a symmetric key algorithm that was widely used for data protection in 70s and 80s. So I would say one of the first algorithms that actually came in the market and people were quite excited were, was about DES because we actually started with um, more of like a symmetric encryption first. And then later on we decided, okay, symmetric encryption has its own problems because you need to send the key across the wire and you need to share the, uh, the key. So that's why asymmetric key, uh, keys came into uh, picture. But uh, to understand, so DES was a symmetric key encryption algorithm. And uh, note that it was actually developed by IBM. So uh, we know the international business machines, right? So IBM is a pretty big company. So IBM uh, was the creator or who was the company who developed in 1970s. And it was actually adopted by the US government as a federal standard, very important. So this. Um, by 1977, it actually became a federal standard, right? In um, and DES uses a 56-bit key, 56-bit uh, key, right, to encrypt and decrypt the data in 64-bit blocks. So as we studied, so you have a cipher algorithm, and the input to a cipher algorithm is a key, or or, or as I said, it would be a set of prim certain prime numbers, a set of numbers. Here, the DES used to have 56-bit uh, cipher key, and if you see, uh, we've taken a, a good example here where it describes how a DES uh, key um, or DES algorithm works. What it does, it basically generates a lot of permutations and several rounds. Normally, it used to take like 16 different rounds uh, of encryption to actually generate a ciphertext, right? So, the encryption process involves multiple rounds of substitution and permutation. So if you see, uh, there are multiple rounds of substitution and permutation operations on the input data. So now if you imagine in terms of uh, Caesar cipher, what we studied was very simple, right? We were just moving three uh, places across. Here we are talking about multiple substitutions. Here we are talking about multiple permutations as well. So all we are trying to make is we are trying to make a very complex mathematical formula to actually come up with a strong encryption decryption algorithm I'd say. So uh, DES uh, was actually known for its simplicity and speed and it um, made it very widely adopted for a range of applications because people as I said uh, they got really excited uh, that oh uh, DES was able to solve a lot of problems for them and as we know because it, it, it uses symmetric uh, key, key encryption algorithm so definitely it was fast it uses less computational power but DES brought its own challenges, right? Uh, there were numerous occasions when uh, the DES encryption was broken. And uh, so it was discovered to be really vulnerable to brute force attacks. And the, the problem was related to its small key size. So um, the scientists or the mathematician realized that 56 bit uh, key size was not good enough to actually have a, achieve a strong encryption. That's why um, over the period of time, the DES algorithm died down, right? So, and so NIST then came up and said, well, we really need to stop using DES and we need to come up with more sophisticated uh, encryption algorithms and that gave birth to AES. And we will study AES in the next video. It is called Advanced Encryption Standard and it was developed and adopted in 2001. So if you see, it's not been too long uh, since AES has been there several, I would say, um, say almost a, um, more than a decade, I, I would say. All right. So, um, uh, so the thing to understand here is that DES was really good when it came, but as, as we know, the hackers are becoming really intelligent over the period of time. So they were able to break these encryptions, um, uh, say, and algorithms. And that's why uh, NIST clearly said that we shouldn't be using DES because 
it was vulnerable to due to its small ski size and uh, they came up with aes and very very important point guys please remember des is no longer considered secure not even secured today and not recommended so it is not recommended uh, for use in modern cryptography why we are studying des is just because as i told you whenever we are doing a deep dive in a topic it's always good to know its base it's always good to know its history so how aes came into picture we need to know because it came from des right so as i said when des died it gave birth to aes right so we need to understand that bit why the what was des why it was being used what were the problems why aes came to picture so yes um so i would say um uh, thanks for watching uh, now in the next video we will talk about aes cheers so after taking a look into the des or data encryption standard it's time to take a look into aes or the advanced encryption standard now as we as we already uh, understood uh, that they were a lot of disadvantages or it or the des algorithm was not considered to be too secure that's why it was decided that the des algorithm would be discontinued and we need to come up with aes so again aes is basically a symmetric key encryption algorithm always remember we are studying symmetric key al encryption algorithms first so first one we studied was des the second one is aes so aes is a symmetric key encryption algorithm and it was adopted uh, adopted by the US government in 2001 and if I can I can say uh, that till date it is actually being used uh, by uh, the US government uh, which is the AES encryption standard and as we already discussed it actually replaced the aging data encryption standard now just like uh, DES it is actually a block cipher so block cipher is basically it encrypts the data in blocks so if i give you an example like a 128 bit block cipher um, will actually bring uh, or use 128 bits of plain text and encrypts it into a 128 bits of cipher text so what it does if you see it uses several combinations several combinations and it is using 128 bit then it uses 120 192 bit then it uses 256 bit so the main thing is it uses a several combinations of uh, I would say secret key plain text secret key plain text and it uses um, multiple rounds as well as we saw so multiple rounds of substitution and multiple rounds of permutations just again the aim is to make it a really complex uh, algorithm so that not uh, any hacker can just go ahead and break uh, our algorithm or break our encrypted data right so it uses a variable length key with options as we studied and that it can you can either use 128 bit key now you might remember in des we used to use 56 bit key right that that was the maximum we used to uh, use that's why it got discontinued and if you see aes it actually starts from 128 goes to 192 and then 256 so normally the recommended um, uh, say key size is 256 bit keys uh, these days and um, the encryption process involves multiple rounds of substitution as i said you are having multiple rounds of substitution you are having different permutations and mixing these operations between the the secret key and the plain text right you are having multiple rounds of these so you, you are let's say uh, you are taking a block of of plain text uh, taking the secret key generating uh, generating a, a, a block cipher right then you uh, again take uh, some part of the plain text or some block of the plain text apply secret key get your cipher text so it, it uses that multiple number of times right so <clears throat> it uses multiple rounds of substitutions permutations and mixing operations on the input data using a combination of secret key and plain text as we just saw and um, yeah it is considered to be highly secure and uh, if you ask me today today uh, most of the financial transactions military communications that are happening actually are utilizing the aes or the advanced encryption standard and um, quite important uh, it is uh, also adopted as a standard by 
take NIST. What is NIST? So NIST is nothing but the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So NIST would actually uh, tell us uh, that, okay, which is uh, which are the recommended, um, say, uh, encryption algorithms, what recommended key size you should be using. So we should always go with the NIST standards. Similar to that, you always know that there is there are ISO standards. So ISO is nothing but International Organization for Standardization. So the, the, the main uh, takeaway is that AES or the Advanced Encryption Standard has been adopted as a standard by both these organizations. And uh, quite importantly, if you see, um, AES is implemented in software and hardware. So a lot of vendors are actually utilizing it. So if, if I give you an example today, uh, say Oracle, um, Oracle is a database uh, technology or, or a database or an RDBMS for its encryption, which is called Transparent Data Encryption TDE. It also utilizes symmetric key encryption uh, and they use AES for that, right? <clears throat> so very important and the key point here is that AES is considered to be the most widely used and secure encryption standard in modern cryptography. When I'm talking about symmetric key encryption, if anybody asks you which is the go-to algorithm in symmetric key encryption, your answer should be AES or the Advanced Encryption Standard, right? Please uh, remember the DES or the data encryption standard that we studied, it was just to understand the various algorithms and to understand the, the death of DES led to the birth of AES. Thanks for watching. Okay, so we started from very simple things. We studied the history of cryptography. We looked at different uh, techniques in cryptography. We looked at, uh, say, symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption. We also studied um, the, uh, I would say, several approved algorithms for symmetric uh, encryption like DES. We studied AES. Now it's time to understand the NIST approved asymmetric algorithms. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite excited to actually uh, go deep dive into all these algorithms. Now, what is NIST? The first question comes, what is NIST? NIST is nothing but it is a National Institute of Standards and Technology. And NIST actually develops cybersecurity standards, guidelines, and best practices and other resources to meet the needs of the US industry, federal agencies, and I would say the broader public, right? So, and, and NIST has given us a list of approved, approved algorithms. And I would say it's, it's pretty good. Why? Because there are so many uh, algorithms available in the market and you as a vendor, let's say you are coming up with the own, um, say, uh, say a new application and you need to use encryption in that or you need to uh, employ encrypt encryption in that. So which one to go for, right? So that's why NIST has actually published all these algorithms and these are the RSA algorithm, which is the Revest, Shamir, Eldelem, uh, Edelman, and these are actually based on the names of the, uh, I would say the mathematicians who actually uh, came up with this algorithm. Then we have the DSA algorithm, which is also called the Digital Signature Algorithm. As the name suggests, it is the algorithm which is used in today's world for making digital signatures, for signing, uh, say, digital or using digital certificates. Then we have the ECDSA, also called the Elliptical Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. Another um, key algorithm that is actually used for digital signatures is ECDSA. Then we have another one, which is the Defi Hellman, which is DH algorithm. And so what I want to say here is we will do a deep dive into all these algorithms. We will understand what are the mathematical formulas behind these? What kind of keys we should be using? So it would, honestly guys, it is going to be a really, really interesting journey from here onwards. So keep watching. Hello folks, welcome back. So the time has finally come to take a look into the various NIST approved asymmetric algorithms. Now the very first one that we will be working on or taking a look into is the RSA algorithm. I would say RSA is the oldest and the most popular of them all, right? So what exactly is the RSA algorithm? So RSA is actually based on the creators. And to be honest, I would say these are the geniuses in front of you. So they were Revest, Shamir, 
Edelman. Now, the thing is that the as the name suggests RSA, so it's actually based on the names of the creators. So Rivest was actually born in uh, 1947. He was a BSc, which is Bachelor of Science in Mathematics at Yale University, Stanford, which is U.S. Shamir, uh, who was born 1952, was a BSc or Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, PhD at Weizmann Institute. So this guy was from Israel. And Edelman, born 1945 and a BA in Mathematics, PhD, and he was from California, Berkeley. So again, US. So as you can make out that these are the guys who came up with the RSA public crypto system. And they, they are not uh, really computer programmers as such. These are actual mathematicians. They are PhDs. If you see the, the most like a couple of them, they, they were actually PhD in maths, right? So this is where I was trying to tell you when we are talking or understanding crypto system, the base of crypto system or cryptography is mathematics. So if you're really good at mathematics, then you can always work on these kind of algorithms. Right. So moving on, let's try to get a better understanding what of what RSA algorithm is all about. So RSA, now we all know, stands for Revest Shamir Edelman, right? Named after its inventors. Good. It is a public key cryptographic algorithm. So I think by now, uh, most of uh, the guys can uh, understand when we say public key cryptography, what we mean is that you are using different keys for encryption and decryption. Now, you can easily compare it with a symmetric key encryption where we said in symmetric key encryption, the same key is used for encryption and the same key is used for decryption, right? But RSA algorithm, because it's an asymmetric algorithm, it is using different keys for encryption and decryption. And RSA is actually known for a couple of use cases. So as, as we said, you can use it for uh, secure communication and it's also used for digital signatures. Later on, uh, we will see uh, more advanced uh, algorithms like uh, the elliptical curve, ECDSA, I would say, and the defi hellman uh, for which is actually used for this. But um, I would say RSA is also used for digital signatures. Um, the main thing uh, is that it relies on the difficulty of factoring large composite numbers into prime factors. So um, the base for, uh, for the RSA algorithm is working on prime numbers. And we will see uh, with an example as well that you talk about prime numbers. In, in our example, we might take smaller prime numbers, but in real world, uh, you actually take large, very large prime numbers, right? So the key generation actually involves choosing two large prime numbers, right? As I said, and computing their product. So, uh, so you always have a public and private key pair. So you will notice that for creating or generating the public key, uh, you would be using the uh, product of these two large prime numbers. So one part of that public key would be a product of these two large prime numbers. Again, we will actually uh, take a good uh, deep uh, dive into uh, the calculations uh, that are uh, involved around this. But for, for the moment, just think about it that you are it's based on the difficulty of factoring large composite numbers and you are for the key you are actually choosing two large prime numbers right and for the uh, creation of a public key one of the components is the product of uh, these two prime uh, uh, two prime numbers and uh, pretty simple right so rsa says that you have to raise the plain text message to the power of public key so in this we are getting the public key and here we are utilizing that public key and taking the result modulo. So a result modulo is more of like a remainder, right? So when you're doing a division operation that the, the modulo is, you, you can say that the kind of remainder that you're getting out of that div division, right? So the RSA encryption involves raising the plain text. So basically, anyways, you, you're, you are starting with the plain text and you need to convert into a cipher text, right? So you take your plain text and you raise it to the power of the public key. So you, in, in the first instance, you're getting a public key. So you raise the plain text to the power of public key and take the result model, which is taking the uh, remainder. And uh, again, now when you have the encrypted text, you actually get your ciphertext. Now, what does decryption do? So decryption would be 
Input is for the decryption is your ciphertext. So here you work on your ciphertext, you raise the ciphertext to the power of private key, right? And take the result model. So same way, right? So it is saying when you are talking about converting uh, plain text to ciphertext, you take plain text raised to the power of public key. And for uh, ciphertext, you take the ciphertext raised to the power of private key. And we will see actually in, in, the, in the example. So don't get confused for the moment. Just uh, try and see uh, and try and understand uh, what are the basics of what happens under the hood. Um, and yes, uh, like any other encryption technology or an algorithm, RSA has been vulnerable to attacks if the key size is too small. So don't ever go for small prime numbers. Always go for a large key size. And you know, the NIST has now recommended that you should at least be using 2048 bits. Now you can actually imagine the key size uh, is so important, right? When we talked about the DES algorithm, we were saying that it was 50, it started 56 bit key. And, and that's why it was not uh, very secure. Now here uh, with RSA, which is part of the asymmetric algorithm, we are talking about a key size of 2048 bits, which is pretty, pretty humongous key size. And um, RSA is actually slower than other algorithms. Uh, as I said, that like there have been advancements. Like we are talking about the guys who were born in 1945, in 40s. And, and I think this, this algorithm would have been there by 1970s or so, right? But there has always been advancements and new algorithms have come up like the elliptical curve, Jeffy Hellman. So they offer more stronger security, I would say, and they are rather more complex as well. This is when you are actually trying to understand, it's, it's more easier to understand an RSA algorithm, but when you talk about elliptical curves, it talks about more advanced mathematics. So um, yes, RSA is slower, but uh, there are other algorithms that have come up. And um, RSA, even though it's slower or whatever uh, the, the problems we talked about, but still it's really widely used. So as I, as I told you guys, it's, it's quite popular, very popular algorithm still being used, still being supported by many systems and software. And it is the popular choice for cryptographic applications. So a lot of uh, applications uh, still utilize RSA uh, for, for their several use cases. Uh, as, as we do understand, there are new algorithms that have come up because there have been advancements in mathematics, in cryptography. But if you are learning cryptography, it is, I would say, quite important that you get a good understanding of what an RSA algorithm is all about. So I would say in the next video, we will really do a proper deep dive. We'll try to do some mathematical calculations. We'll do it together and see if you are able to understand how the RSA algorithm works behind the scenes. Thanks for watching. So in the previous video, we had a look at what an RSA algorithm is all about. In this video, we will take a look at how an RSA algorithm works under the hood. So now, as I told you that all we are doing is when we are working on encryption and decryption, we are working with prime numbers. And I always tell you that in the real world, you are actually working on very large prime numbers. But here, uh, the example that we'd be doing, we, we are just taking simple numbers to understand the whole algorithm. So just to uh, get your understanding on this, I would suggest that please try and keep a pen and paper ready when you are working and try and work with me. So on your left side, you will actually see the whole process, what RSA algorithm is all about, right? When the first part talks about key generation because we need to come up with a public key and then we need to come up with a private key. So you come up with a key pair that is public key pair, a public private key pair, right? And then at the end of the day, uh, what is our aim? Our aim is to encrypt and our aim is to decrypt. But how does this whole thing takes place? Let's see how it goes under the hood. So first it says we need to select the value of P and Q. As I told you that both the P and Q should be prime numbers. Now, if you may ask that what is a prime number? A prime number is a whole number that can't be divided by any other whole number. So, and we, we say that the only factors of that number are one and the number itself. So here we are choosing very simple prime numbers like the value is P is equal to three and Q is equal to 11, right? What does the sec second part say? The second says calculate the value of N as P times Q, very simple. So we are computing the value of N as P times Q. So P times Q, we know P is three, Q is 11. So three times 11 is 33. 
up to here. I think it's all good. Then it says you need to calculate the value of phi n is p minus 1 times q minus 1, right? So we, we look here. So computing the phi n is p minus 1 times q minus 1. p is 3, so 2 minus 1, 3 minus 1, 2, and q minus 1. q is 11, so 11 minus 1, 10. So 2 times 10 is 20, right? So you get the value of phi n as 20, right? Up to here again, all good. Then it says you need to select integer e, right? So we need to come up with an value of integer e. Now, how is that integer e? Uh, how is that related? What it says, uh, the whole thing can be translated as this, where we are saying choose e such that 1 is less than e is less than phi of n. So I can say that 1 is less than e is less than, what is phi of n? 20. Very good. So we are saying choose a value of e which is between e between 1 and 20 and it should um, it should uh, correspond to this this value which is gcd uh, phi of n and e is equal to 1 right and what we are saying is that e and phi n are both co-prime. So let's say we choose or, or we get the value of e is equal to 7. Because if you see, uh, 7 is uh, comes in between uh, 1 and 20. So we are saying it is 7 uh, is the number. It is also co-prime, right? What does it say next? Next it says calculate the value of d, right? So uh, how you get the value of d is it says e to the power of minus 1 modulo phi of n, right? So again, you can translate this into this, where it says d times e percent phi of n equal to 1. So what is d times e, right? So here we are saying the value of d times e. We are now taking the value of d as number 3, right? So we are saying 3 times 7 is 21. 21 percent 20 is 1. So all you're getting is you're getting the remainder, right? When we say modulo, we are actually talking about the remainder right okay i think it's it's pretty good till now so then it says you need to now compute your public key so now we have all the values with us right we have the value of n we have the value of e we have the value of d so the public key how the public key is is comprised the public key comprises of e comma n and the private key comprises of d comma n so if you see there are certain um, certain similarities or or, or um, a part of it is is like n is actually being used both ways so that's why we always say it's a key pair right you, they they are kind of intertwined interlinked to each other now a pretty simple public key is e e comma n so now by now we know that e is the value 7 and 7 we give and uh, n we give the value as 33 right so 33 we get from here and we get 7 comma 33 again private uh, key is uh, d uh, comma n so we know that, that d we got uh, the figure from here which is number 3 and the value of n as we see here is 33 so we get the public key as 7 comma 33 and private key as 3 comma 33 pretty simple you are with me in by now i think if, you, if, if you're still feeling confused it is it is pretty simple just trust me just take a pen and paper just try and work through these calculations and they are all given here and you can be, work alongside it next it says uh, okay now your input is a plain text and we need to encrypt it to get a cipher text and how do you do that right so what it says is that for encryption, what you need to do is, or to, to get a cipher text, it should be m to the power of e modulo n, right? So what we are doing is, let's say the m value for m is 2, right? So it is saying c is equal to 2 to the power of 7. So now you can think of 2 as your plain text. We are saying 2 to the power of 7 percent 33 right so what is 2 to the power of 7 so 2 to the power of 7 is 128 right so we are saying divide 128 by 33 and if we do that it, we take 3 3 times 9 3 times 3 is 9 3 times 3 9 and we get the remainder as 29 and if you see this 29 corresponds to this value 29 right so we have encrypted our plain text 2 how did we do that we said plain text to the power of 7 now 7 was the value e right e this one which is 7 right percent 33 29 
Now, what is decryption? De uh, we all know by now that decryption is nothing but the reverse, wherein your input becomes your ciphertext, right? So here uh, the input is ciphertext, right? Now I need to go back and get my plain text. How do I get my plain text? I start with my ciphertext and it I raise it to the power of D, right? What was D? We remember D is three. So we are saying that's why your input is your cipher ciphertext, this one, which, which we got here in the previous um, in, uh, encrypted output. And we are saying 29 to the power, ciphertext to the power of D percent 33, right? Again, we're getting a modulo. Basically, we're getting a remainder. And that's the good thing, right? So you'll see this was your plain text, right? We encrypted it to a value 29. Then we use the 29 value we decrypted using our algorithm and we got the value back as two, right? So all I wanted to show you was how this whole thing of encryption decryption takes place, how you start with your plain text, you encrypt it and get a ciphertext, how you use the ciphertext, apply the key and you get your original text back. Very important. And another um, key thing, uh, please remember that since 2015, NIST has recommended that a minimum of 2048 bits keys for RSA should be used, right? It, it's a clear, clear recommendation from NIST that you shouldn't be using uh, a smaller key length or whatever just I showed it was anyways for an example to understand how it works under the hood. So uh, please remember you use uh, larger key sizes if you use smaller key sizes, as I told you previously, they are always uh, susceptible uh, to um, uh, brute force attacks, right? So always remember NIST recommends that a minimum of 2048 bit keys should be used and uh, it's, it's, the, it's the recommendation. So I believe uh, you would have got good understanding how RSA algorithm works under the hood. Thanks for watching. So after getting a very good understanding of your RSA algorithm, it's time to move on to the next important algorithm, which is the DSA algorithm. Now, what is DSA? So DSA basically stand for a digital signature algorithm, right? So DSA, digital signature al algorithm. Now you might ask that, okay, we are studying digital signature algorithm, but what is a digital signature, right? So a digital signature is nothing but a digital code. Now that digital code is generated and authenticated by public key encryption which is actually attached to the message or to the document to verify the contents of the message and also to verify the sender's identity. That's quite important, right? So digital signature algorithm was actually developed by NIST. So by now, we all know what NIST is. NIST is nothing but the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Now, again, uh, Behind the scenes, it's all advanced mathematics, right? So a digital signature algorithm, and we'll see in the next video, like how it works under the hood. But again, it's actually based on mathematical concept of modular exponentiation and discrete logarithms. So um, modular exponentiation is nothing but the exponentiation which is performed over a modulus, right? So again, uh, for the moment, I'll say it's just advanced mathematics that it's all based on. Ah, very important point. DSA is a public key algorithm, right? Now by now we, we know that we are understanding or, or talking about asymmetric, right? So asymmetric is always multiple keys, right? You, you have a public private key pair. Now, the main thing to understand here is please don't get confused with digital signature algorithm. It is only used for digital signatures, right? So no encryption or decryption of messages is being done, right? So please remember that. So it's only the digital signatures. Now you might ask, but you have a concept of keys. Yes, we do have a concept of keys, but these keys are used for either signing or verifying the messages, right? So there's a, dis there's a difference we need to understand. In RSA, what we were doing, in RSA, we were actually encrypting a uh, original text and generating a cipher text, transmitting it over the wire, right? But here, what we are saying is we are using the pair of keys, but we are using the pair of keys to just sign the document. And then 
you're using the other key to verify the messages, right? So quite important. Now, uh, you might remember when we discussed a Joy and Aileen example where Joy had to send a message to Aileen and Joy was signing with his own private key and then Aileen was decrypting it using Joy's a public key because it was available. That's the same concept we are using here. The signing key is actually kept secret, which means we are signing with a private key and you are on the other side, then you are verifying it with the public key, right? So because it's a public key algorithm, you have a public private key pair, you sign with your private key and then on the other side, you use the public key for the verification. Now, you might remember when Joy and Aileen example we took, we said that this gives you integrity and authentication. So, which actually shows that Joy is an authentic source. You, it's, it's basically this message or this document is coming from an authentic source. So, you can, you can basically trust on that person, right? So, um, a very important DSA generates signatures that are unique to the message, right? Um, which are being signed and the signing key used. So there is a concept of in digital signature algorithm, they use a concept of random key. So because of that, you will always see the DSA will generate the signatures that are unique uh, to that. Um, again, uh, quite related to the first part that we discussed that signature can be verified by anyone. Why? Because it's through the public key, right? Public key is available to everyone. So Joy's public key, let's say, is available to everyone because it's public, right? But it's signed using a private key. That's why it says the signature can be verified by anyone who has the verification key and the original message. So you need to have the original message and you need to have the right public key available with you to, to actually verify it. Again, uh, talking about uh, Joy and Aileen's example, again, I keep going back. You might remember when I said if Joy signs using his private key, it means that we are talking about authenticity, integrity and non-repudiation. Uh, so again, uh, I'm just repeating it, but you might remember we said that the message has come from an authentic source and that message hasn't been tempered at all. This is what digital signature algorithm is all about. So um, again, uh, RSA was used for multiple things, multiple use cases. RSA, you could use RSA algorithm in encrypting, decrypting documents. You can even use for digital signatures as well. But DSA is purely used for digital signatures. And it says DSA has been widely adopted and used in many applications, including secure communications, e-commerce and digital document signing. This is the perfect and the main use case for DSA. Again, um, DSA is a standardized algorithm and very important. There are certain parameters you need to give to the DSA algorithm. So when you're working with DSA, there are certain well-defined parameters and these parameters have been defined by NIST the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So you need to adhere to those rules. So you can't just uh, simplify, uh, simply give any parameters you like. You have to give the parameters that have been specified and given or recommended by uh, NIST. So uh, quite important guys. So after studying RSA, we have got a very good understanding of what a DSA algorithm is all about. It's a digital signature algorithm. I hope you liked the video. Thank you. Hello. So after having a very good understanding of the RSA algorithm and the DSA algorithm, it's now time to move on to another important algorithm, which is the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. And again, folks, just like uh, what we saw in RSA, the real geniuses, they are actually in front of you now. So the these are the guys who actually invented the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, which is actually named after their names itself. So let's let's try and understand what is a Diffie-Hellman algorithm, right? So uh, the very first thing is it's a public key exchange algorithm used for secure communication over an insecure network. That is the key here. So by now, I think everybody who's taken my course now would understand when we are saying public key exchange, you can easily make out, yes, we are talking about multiple keys. 
so it's it's different from a symmetric algorithm or a symmetric key definitely it's a asymmetric key where there, there would be some kind of key pairs right so it is a public key exchange algorithm now that is another uh, thing that we need to understand here the usage of Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Now with RSA, we figured out that RSA can be used for encrypting the messages and it can also be used for digital signatures. With a DSA, we figured out that it is a, an algorithm which is actually used mainly for digital signatures. But now what is the usage of Diffie-Hellman? So Diffie-Hellman helps you to have a public key exchange. So it allows a mechanism in which you can exchange or both the parties can have the same keys right but the magic here is that you have to use secure communication over an insecure network like internet right and we will we will we will see how this whole magic happens and we will take an example of uh, coloring uh, scheme I'll, I'll show you where um, two people alice and bob will be talking to each other and eventually they start with uh, same colors and end up encrypting each other's uh, messages and then uh, they come up with uh, the shared secret right so um, as we now understand it was invented by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman in 1976 so just just think about it that back in 1976 they invented it and till date till date it is being utilized so please please uh, have a good understanding of how a Diffie-Hellman algorithm works. So Diffie-Hellman allows two parties to establish a shared secret key and that is the aim, right? Both the parties will have a shared secret key. Now just think about what we learned in symmetric encryption and that was a benefit of symmetric encryption. Once both the parties have the same key, it uses less computational power and it is it is uh, say i would say it is far quicker as well right and it, it gives the speed to the algorithm as well so that is what is the main aim so first you need to establish a shared secret key so that the sender and receiver know that okay if i have to encrypt i need to use this key and i need to decrypt i need to use the this key right without having to exchange the key directly that is the magic right so you're not sending your key over the wire but you will be sending the encrypted key and then based on the decryption and based on the algorithm you use eventually you'll end up having same key on the sender and receiver if it is becoming confusing don't worry we will take up in the very next video we will discuss how this uh, can this works using a color uh, mechanism so this uh, Diffie-Hellman is based on the difficulty of the discrete logarithmic problems in a finite field. Now, uh, again, uh, it's all talking about advanced mathematics. So discrete algorithms or discrete logarithms are the logarithms which are defined with regards to the multiplicative cyclic groups, right? So, and now you might uh, ask, okay, but what is a mul multiplicative cyclic group or a group? So in mathematics, so I would say in advanced mathematics, multiplicative group refers to one of the following concepts. So it's a group under multiplication of invertible elements of a field or a ring. And again, uh, remember um, here in Diffie-Hellman algorithm, we are always talking about large prime numbers, right? So use, uh, there is a usage of large prime numbers and there is a generator of the prime numbers multiplicative group and a, sh a random shared secret numbers are chosen by each party. Now uh, you can you can try and imagine about uh, the Joy and Aileen uh, example we studied where we uh, uh, actually did the hybrid encryption. So I'm, I'm writing it down hybrid encryption. Probably you can uh, visit that lecture one more time in that that is what the uh, main aim was. You are using asymmetric encryption to eventually use the symmetric uh, encryption, right? Uh, that is what uh, Diffie-Hellman does. So it is helping you to come up with a shared secret, but how do you get it? You use large prime numbers, you use prime numbers multiplicative group, and you use some secret, random secret numbers on, on both parties. Um, yes, the parties use their secret numbers to compute a shared secret value that can be used for symmetric encryption key. 
Exactly. That is what I was trying to explain you that the aim is to reach to a shared secret key. So once you have the shared secret key, it means if I am encrypting using uh, that shared secret key, the, uh, the other party can easily decrypt using that secret key. And we don't have to even exchange this information or send the key over the wire. Uh, so it is, it is quite important that the aim is again, that the parties use their secret numbers but they compute a shared secret key. Again, don't worry, we will take a look at a very simple example from which you will, you will come to know. Okay, so Diffie-Hellman provides perfect forward secrecy, right? So which says that if a private key is compromised, the past communication cannot be decrypted, right? It's, it's always based on that. So what is a perfect forward secrecy? Now a perfect forward secrecy is a style of encryption that enables short-term private key exchange between a client and a server. And it accomplishes this by utilizing unique session keys that are generated automatically. That is the key here. The, the session keys are generated automatically each time a session is made, right? So always remember Diffie-Hellman gives you forward secrecy or perfect forward secrecy. Uh, now you may ask, okay, in which uh, applications, what are the different use cases where Diffie-Hellman is being used? Yes, the, they are the most important ones. SSL, secure socket layer, TLS, transport layer security, SSH. And so let's say if you are actually doing an SSH to, to a Linux terminal, right? You would be using the uh, SSH protocol and we'll be studying all these protocols um, uh, as well. And VPNs, virtual private networks. So all these are the wide applications where you would be using Diffie-Hellman. Again, uh, we are learning standard uh, algorithms, standard protocols, sorry, standard algorithms, which are recommended by NIST. And we already said that these are all the ones that are standard, uh, uh, say, algorithms. So Diffie-Hellman has been standardized by various organizations, not only NIST, but also IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force. So that way you can say that you can, yes, you can very well rely on the Diffie-Hellman algorithm in your applications. Now, uh, the biggest challenge with Diffie-Hellman is, as I said, that you are not really sharing, you're not sending the key itself, but you are sending the key in, in a, some, some form of encrypted manner, right? So that is where uh, the Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable to the man-in-the-middle attacks. And uh, uh, by now you, uh, I guess, are already aware of what a man-in-the-middle attack is. Basically, you're a hacker, right, who's, who's trying to get uh, the encrypted message and trying to decipher out of it that what that uh, what that shared secret key is. So right. So it's vulnerable to man in the middle attack where the attacker intercepts the communication and alters the shared secret. Right. So just imagine if the hacker is changing your secret key, then the hacker can start talking to the receiving party and the receiving party would feel, oh, um, oh, that's good. Right. OK, I'm talking to this this guy and this is uh, an authentic source. Now comes a very interesting thing that we already learned, but how can you prevent this? Yes, you can prevent it using additional cryptographic mechanisms such as digital signatures. Now I can ask you, and if you close your eyes and give me the answer, why would you use digital signatures to prevent man in the middle attacks? Okay, so let me try and explain you. So the thing is that what we learned from a digital signature was, because you were signing using your own private key, which means that it gives you that the message or the source is an authentic source, right? So that's where we said that you are getting integrity and you are getting authenticity, right? So this is where we are combining both the things. So with Diffie-Hellman, what we are saying, if it is prone to man in the middle attack, why don't we uh, have additional cryptography mechanism on top of it using digital signature? Because that would give you the integrity. That is all we want to make sure that the, the source that we are talking to is the authentic source. So, uh, so guys, thank you for watching. In the next video, we will take a look how the Diffie-Hellman algorithm works under the hood. So we'll do it using a color coding scheme. Thanks for watching. Okay, so welcome to another interesting video. And in this video, we will learn how the Diffie-Hellman algorithm works under the hood.
right? So I told you in the previous video, the main aim of a Diffie-Hellman algorithm is to have a shared secret. Basically, once you have the shared secret, then eventually you can actually utilize your symmetric key because if the sender and the receiver have got the shared secret, then they can easily encrypt the message and decrypt it using the shared secret. And that is what the aim of Diffie-Hellman algorithm is. Now, let's take a look how this actually works behind the scenes. So here we are taking an example and we'll go very slow. So Alice needs to talk to Bob, right? Alice and Bob, um, we, are, we are taking it as two parties. You can say they are the sender and receiver and they need to talk to each other and in, 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 in an insecure environment, right? So you, you could say they are talking to each other on an internet, right? So what happens is we will try and understand using color um, coding or you can say a uh, color mixing as such. So you can you can take yourself back to the days when we used to study in, in primary school and we used to mix colors, right? That is what we'll be doing now. So what it says is, first of all, Alice and Bob decide to have a common paint, right? First of all, you decide, Alice tells Bob and Bob tells Alice, hey, hey, uh, Bob, uh, let's uh, try and work on a common color, right? Alice says, okay, yellow and Bob says yellow, so, right? So by this time, both the parties know that yes, yellow is the common color. We need to start with yellow. Okay, you start with yellow. Now comes the part where you need to use your own secret color, right? This is secret, secret to Alice and secret to Bob. So let's say um, Alice says, uh, okay, I'll, I'll pick red color, but you don't have to tell anybody, right? Alice is not telling that secret color to anybody. Same way Bob is coming up with, with uh, another secret color and Bob is not telling that secret color to anybody, right? Good, good till this point, right? Now, uh, if you may ask, what are these secret colors? Just imagine in, in computers or in, in uh, mathematics, it would be large prime numbers. Again, we are always talking about large prime numbers. We're not talking about small numbers, but large prime numbers you are talking about, right? So now comes the concept of mixing, right? So we are mixing the colors. So, uh, okay. So what we are doing is we are taking this common paint that we took plus the secret key that we took or the secret color and we are coming up with something like an orange color here. So Alice is coming up with an orange color and Bob does the same thing. So Bob uses the common paint, his secret color and gets something like a blue, right? So Alice has come up with an orange, Bob has come up with a blue. And this is the thing that happens here, right? Now Alice says, okay, let me send this over to Bob and then Bob sends this to Alice. So an exchange of information is taking place, right? But the key here is if you, if you read this, this is a public transport happening and very important, assume that the mixture separation is expensive, right? What does that mean? So what it means is, let's say if a hacker or a man in the middle comes and tries to read this, they won't be able to separate it out, right? It, it, is, it is at that level. Let's say a hacker gets this orange color or a hacker gets this blue color, they shouldn't be able to separate the colors to get that, oh, this blue has been formed with a combination of a yellow and a, and a, and a secret, which is orange, right? So that is where the strength or the robustness of the algorithm comes it should be really strong, really strong algorithm and really big prime numbers that you should be using that even if a hacker comes, they can't separate this mixture out. Very important. Okay, so going back. So let's say now Alice has got the, uh, the color that was sent by Bob and Bob has sent the, uh, got the color that was exchanged by Alice, right? So now both the parties have got the, the, uh, the mixed colors, I would say. Okay, now comes the magic, right? The magic is now Alice will apply its own secret color here, right? So it's the same secret color that Alice had chosen in the beginning. Now Alice will mix the blue with her own secret color to get a new color, which is brown. And Bob will do the same thing. The exchange information that uh, uh, Bob got Bob will be mixing the same secret key 
and applying that to get the color and if you see happy days because you have got the same secret key right so now both the parties alice bob have got their their common secret right nobody knows that apart from alice and bob and they have they have um, made it possible over a public internet even if a hacker came tried to get that they won't be able to understand that is the beauty of this algorithm that even on a non secure insecure network you are able to perform a secure communication because once you come up with your common secret then i can encrypt i can decrypt using the same secret which gives me hybrid encryption or you can say which would allow me the symmetric uh, key encryption which is much faster which uses less computational power so i guess uh, by now you would have got a good understanding of how a diffie hellman algorithm works under the hood now in the next video we will actually try and start working on some numbers we'll do some mathematics and see how this color mixing or the paint mixing that we learned can be applied to the actual diffie hellman algorithm thanks for watching hello and welcome to a very interesting video on diffie hellman under the hood using mathematical calculations so in the previous video we understood how the diffie hellman uh, algorithm works we took the example of paint mixing where alice and bob came up with a common paint they selected their own secret colors came up with a new uh, new paint as you can see here alice comes up with orange and bob comes with a specific color then they exchange these paints and then add on the secret color for, for each of those and then they eventually get back the common secret which nobody knows of, uh, of it and only alice and bob knows it but let's say how uh, mathematically it works so mathematically how it says is that where we said that both alice and bob come up with the common paint which is yellow in the term of mathematics it says uh, so alice and bob begin by deciding mutually two numbers so the important thing is both alice and bob are aware of these numbers and in mathematics we call these numbers as modulus of p and base g right so you can think of it that both alice and bob are aware of these two numbers and you can uh, map these to the your yellow color right so you can think of it as your yellow color what we just learned in the uh, example right so and it says um, in practical use modulus p is a very large prime number as we've always said when you're doing encryption uh, you always choose very large prime numbers and base g is norm normally a small number number for uh, calculations right so uh, and we say that okay we choose the value of p uh, modulus p is 17 and base g is 4 right now what we say is uh, once uh, they have mutually decided on these numbers alice settles on a secret number and bob settles on a secret number right so here we are talking about this so let's say alice chooses a secret number as a equals three and bob chooses b equal to six right so we said this yellow color corresponds to modulus p and base g the value for modulus p is 17 base g is 4 now alice chooses a secret color orange and that is a value is a equal to 3 and bob chooses his own number the value is b equal to 6 these are kind of you can say secret or private to alice and bob right now uh, we are doing a mixing right the mixing is happening how this mixing is happening so this mixing happens using a mathematical calculation which is a equal to g to the power of a modulus p so now what is a we know g is uh, our base g is 4 so 4 to the power of 3 modulus of 17 which means 4 times 4 16 times 4 64 modulus 17 so it is basically you are dividing and you're getting the remainder so you get the value as a is 13 so just just remember this is a equal to 13 so this is capital a and in first instance it was small a so now we got uh, the uh, color, the mixed color, which is for Alice, which is A equal to 13. Same way Bob will be doing some uh, calculations and getting his uh, own color. So how Bob does, Bob does it as 4 to the power of uh, 6 modulus uh, 17, right? So same way uh, you see that uh, the value for B equal to 16, right? 
So it's 4 to the power 6 modulus 17. It's cl clearly stated here. You can multiply on calculator as well. So 4096 modulus 17, right? You, you get it as the value of B, right? So we get the value of B is 16, right? So in the next stage, we said this gets transferred and this gets transferred. So, and we clearly stated that so mixed color is getting transferred. So even if a hacker comes in, the algorithm should be so complex that the hacker shouldn't be able to separate them out, right? So now we say, okay, B equal to 16 comes here, right? And A equal to 13 goes here, perfect. Now what happens? Now the next stage is we are saying Alice needs to apply her secret key and Bob needs to apply his own secret key. Let's see how mathematically it works. So uh, when you're doing it mathematically, we call it the S as B to the power of A modulus P. Now B we know by now is, is 16. So 16 to the power of three modulus 17 because P we said is 17, right? So we get 16 to the power of 3 modulus 17, we get a figure as 16. So this is my now secret key as 16. So if you see this, this color is, is my secret key as 16, right? But the magic should be that we should eventually end up with S equal to 16 here as well. So let's take a look. Yes. So now uh, the secret key is a to the power of b modulus p because here it was b to the power of a modulus p. Here it is a to the power of b modulus b. Now a we know it's 13. 13 to the power of b, b is 6. Modulus 17 is this big number modulus 17. So you're left with the remainder as 16. So perfect. So now we have got s is equal to 16. Right. So we have eventually reached to the common secret. Now, as I told you in the previous video, once you have got your common secret, you can achieve symmetric encryption, right? You can encrypt using the secret key and decrypt using the secret key in a very, very secure manner. So I believe this uh, video was quite interesting for you. If you are getting confused, I would certainly uh, uh, request you to watch this video a couple of more times. Uh, you can go slow, you can take a uh, pen and paper and work on it. These are simple calculations. You just take the example of the color coding on, on your right side and look at the mathematical cal calculations on your left side. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So it's time to take a look at another interesting algorithm. We call it the ECDSA algorithm. Now, what does ECDSA stand for? So ECDSA stand for elliptical curve digital signature algorithm, right? So as the name suggests, it is an algorithm which would be used for digital signatures. And the EC stands for elliptical curve. So let's take a look. So ECDSA is a digital signature algorithm that is based on elliptic curves. Now you may ask, what are elliptic curves? So an elliptic curve is a plane curve over a finite field which is made up of points that satisfy the equation y equals x cubed plus ax plus b, something like this, right? This is actually an elliptical curve. And this is how the entire elliptical curve algorithm is based on. And what it says is that any point on the curve that can be mirrored over the x-axis, the curve will still stay the same, right? So quite important, it is a uh, part of the advanced mathematics, I'd say, uh, the elliptical curve, uh, and, and you can always read about it, what are elliptical curves, but this is how it actually goes about, and this is the kind of formula it uses. Okay, let's take a look further. So it was developed as an alternative to the traditional DSA and R, uh, RSA, right? Uh, quite important. So uh, the RSA algorithms, the DSA algorithms, they were already there in the market, right? But uh, the the scientists or the, or the cryptographers they wanted to work further on it or wanted to improve upon those algorithms that's why these uh, the elliptical curve uh, algorithm came as a uh, alternative to those uh, okay so ecds is a public key algorithm i think by now i have already uh, repeated myself so many number of times that what is a public key algorithm so from here you can easily make out that it is made up of 
pair of keys, right? So there will be a public private key pair and it's not like a, a single key uh, is being used for encrypting and decrypting, right? So it is more of uh, related to the asymmetric keys where you will have a public private key pairs. And as the name suggests, digital signature algorithm, it means this keys or these keys are used for signing and verifying messages. Now, um, it says the signing key is kept secret by the signer, right? While the verification key is made public. So as we know, there's a public private key pair. So the sender is actually signing with his or her own private key, right? And then you are sending it over the network and who can um, uh, say decrypt it? Only the signer's public key, which would anyways be available to anybody. So anybody can uh, open that, but it ha it all it says is that the message can't be tampered. If it is tampered, you can easily come to know, right? So th this is where the digital signatures come um, in into picture that you need to ensure that you are the guy who's actually sending that information across, right? So it's very important. The signing key is kept secret and the verification key is public. Oh, and, and another key point, guys. So you might remember that with RSA keys, we kept on increasing the length of the keys that have to be used. So uh, there was always uh, a recommendation from NIST that uh, with RSA, uh, you need to have bigger keys, key lengths. The beauty about ECDSA is it says that even a 224 bit elliptical curve can provide the same level of security like a 2048-bit RSA key. So just think about it, that it's so powerful that even a smaller key can actually achieve the similar kind of benefits, right? Good. So the signature can be verified by anyone who has the verification key and the original message. So as I said, all we are trying to ensure is that you are the right person or you are, or we are authenticating in a way that it's actually sent by the right person and it's not being tempered or, or it's not a hacker is sending us the message. So you just need to ensure that the signature can be verified by anyone who has the verification key, which is a public key. And uh, now we have already uh, um, learned about it. I won't go into the details of it. Uh, as you might remember, when we <laughs> did the Alex example, and also uh, the Joy and Aileen example, we, we clearly said that if you're signing with your uh, private key and you're um, say uh, using a, a public key to decrypt it, it means that it gives you three things, which is message authenticity, integrity, that no, nobody has tampered with your messages and non-repudiation, right? We've, we've, uh, we've learned about it um, in, in previous lectures. So, um, and yes, it says elliptical uh, curve uh, digital signature algorithm is considered to be more secure than DSA and RSA. Why? Because it's, as I said, it's based on advanced math mathematics and the advanced mathematical properties of elliptical curves. It's quite complex algorithm. So uh, it's, it's considered to be definitely more secure than RSA and DSA. And um, just uh, to, to uh, talk about some use cases. Uh, so uh, ECDSA is normally made, uh, used in uh, applications including secure communication, where you need to ensure secure communication, e-commerce, like you're doing some transactions online and digital document signing. Let's say uh, you are um, uh, you are purchasing a property, right? You are asked to uh, digitally sign a document or uh, uh, the, the, the uh, say the lender would send you, you a document and say, oh, please can you digit digitally sign it. So all we are ensuring is you're the right person who's doing it, right? And it is a standardized algorithm. So very important that the parameters that you specify for ECDSA you have to go with what NIST or ISO has given us. It's not that you can just specify any parameters in ECA, DCSA algorithm. So you have to be careful that you only specify the parameters that have been specified by NIST or ISO. With this, we come to the end of the video for ECDSA. So just another interesting algorithm that we learned. Thanks for watching. Okay, so it's a blank screen in front of us. Yeah. So the thing is that a lot of times I'm actually asked by a lot of folks that, okay, now we have got an understanding of what an RSA algorithm is, what a DSA is, what an ECDSA is, and what a Diffie-Hellman is. You've actually taught us so many different algorithms, but we are really kind of um, confused where to use what and what's the difference between each algorithm. It's, it's getting so, so kind of confusing in the mind, right? 
So I thought, why not come up with a slide which actually shows you each algorithm and shows and talks about the pros and cons of each algorithm. So let's take a look. So the very first algorithm that we learned was the RSA algorithm, right? So uh, with RSA, what we said was it's the, the main pros of RSA are it's widely used and supported by many systems and software. So I think um, you might remember I told you that RSA is the oldest and the most widely used algorithm in, in cryptography, right? And it offers excellent security and has stood the test of time. Very important thing, right? Uh, it has stood the test of time means that it is so old, right? It came somewhere back in 1977, even before I was born probably. And still it has stood the test of time, which means that over the period of time, it's still being utilized, right? Even today, uh, it is being utilized. If it was, uh, say, uh, not that strong, I I'm sure it, it wouldn't have stood uh, for that long. Right? It offers good key sizes. So the, the good thing about RSA is that you can have humongous key sizes, a big massive key sizes. Like NIST started recommending that you should have at least 2048 uh, uh, key size. But what it says is that th that is also a, a, a pro of, of this algorithm that it offers uh, key sizes of 2048, 3072, 4096 bits. And very, very important point, guys. It is good for encryption and digital signatures. So that's the beauty of RSA. Normally, when, when we started other uh, algorithms like DSA or ECDSA, you might have noticed that they were the algorithms which were there for digital signatures. But RSA algorithm is actually there for encryption as well as digital signatures, both. Now, yes, there are certain cons um, and they are that this is actually slower than some other algorithms. Now, in a way, you can say because uh, ECA, ECDSA and DSA were fairly new algorithms, so definitely they would have looked at uh, the existing RSA algorithm and definitely if, if it was uh, slower, they wouldn't have brought those things over in, in the new algorithms, right? It is vulnerable to attacks, but only if you are using a small key size. That's why, as I told you, uh, that uh, 1024 bit RSA keys are no longer considered secure. NIST says that you should be at least at 2048 a bit. So quite important, if you are using RSA, please go with large key sizes. And it also says that sometimes the key generation can be slow for large key sizes. Obviously, right? If you are talking about uh, a, a 4096 bits, key, such a big key if you are creating, then ob obviously the key generation can be slow for large key sizes. Then we looked at the DSA algorithm, right? So what are the pros with DSA? So it says it's faster than RSA, but remember, it is actually used for signing and verifying digital signatures, unlike RSA, which is actually used for encryption and digital signatures. Uh, the good thing about DSA is is, is it requ requires smaller key sizes. So you can actually just use smaller key sizes compared to the equivalent uh, security with RSA, right? And it says that it gives strong security when implemented correctly, which means that you are using the right key size, you are using the right parameters, then you can achieve good amount of security if it is implemented correctly. Um, but yeah, few cons. Now, as compared to DSA, uh, RSA, it is less widely used, right? Because uh, as I told you that RSA is more widely used, very popular. So it is less widely used than and supported than uh, the RSA and ECDSA. Again, uh, quite co a comparison with the RSA, it is only suitable for digital signatures, right? It is not suitable for encryption because uh, with encryption, uh, you can use RSA, right? It's vulnerable to certain type of attacks, such as collision attacks, if used incorrectly. So very important, as I said, the, you are having the right key size and you're having the right parameters to so that you are not vulnerable to any attacks. Then we learned the much newer algorithm, which was the ECDSA, which is elliptical curve digital signature algorithm. So the biggest pro is that it is faster and more efficient. Why? Because as I said, that it is based on elliptical curves which is an advanced mathematic techniques and it is fairly new. So definitely they would have thought about how they can make uh, a, an algorithm which is better than RSA, which is quite old. It offers strong security with uh, 
uh, smaller key sizes. So as we said uh, that if you are using a 224 key size or if you're using a 2048 key size for RSA, it's kind of equivalent, right? So with ECDSA, if you are on 224 um, bit key size, that is equivalent to 2048 bit key size, which makes uh, this as a biggest pro for ECDSA that you can get the same amount of security with smaller key sizes. And it's widely used in mobile and uh, IoT applications. So IoT applications are Internet of Things, we call it. So, um, so it's, it's, it's actually being used for that. There are certain cons. It is less widely used and supported than RSA. Again, we are comparing with RSA. Everything goes back to RSA, right? The Revis Sherman um, algorithm, Shamir algorithm. So uh, the, it is less widely used and supported than RSA. The key generation can be slower than RSA for large key sizes. Again, uh, the problem with ECDSA is because it's based on uh, the mathematical or elliptical curves. If you're going for very high um, or big size uh, keys, then uh, the key generation can be slower, right? Uh, it requires careful selection of elliptical curves. Uh, the elliptical curve itself is quite an advanced and complex mathematical technique. So you need to be very careful. You need to be really good at mathematics to and to get uh, the required um, selection of elliptical curves to avoid any security vulnerabilities, right? Then we also learned the Diffie-Hellman algorithm, very important one, right? So the Diffie-Hellman actually allows for secure key exchange. So you might remember the video where we did uh, the colors, right? You were sending um, the colors to um, each other, right? So then you were, the main uh, criteria was that you need to send across the key, but uh, the hacker shouldn't be able to know that which uh, key you are sending. So we always used to encrypt the uh, key and then send it across. So it allows for the secure key exchange without the need for pre-shared keys. So you are not using any pre-shared keys, but you have your own keys. Then you come up with your own secret keys. You uh, apply those and then uh, you do that, right? Okay, good. So it's actually widely used in VPNs. Now, what is a VPN? VPN is a virtual private network and we will look about VPN in, in upcoming videos. So it's widely used in VPNs and other applications that require secure communication and it is resistant to uh, eavesdroppers and passive attackers. The biggest con uh, with uh, Diffie-Hellman is it's vulnerable to man in the middle attack, if not authenticated. Uh, if you don't use it properly, then Diffie-Hellman -Hel algorithm can be vulnerable uh, or susceptible to the man in the middle attack, right? And it requires careful management of shared secrets to prevent unauthorized access. So when you are actually sharing uh, the uh, the secret, uh, you have to be really careful uh, that you use the right keys, the right key lengths, only then uh, you will achieve the right results. So guys, uh, I think this should really give you a good understanding of all these approved algorithms and how we can compare them with each other. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. In this video, we will take a look at what is PKI or the public key infrastructure. Let me tell you guys, this is the most important thing after encryption, PKI, public key infrastructure. What I want to tell you is if PKI was not there, then Today, you and me would have never done digital banking. So what I want to say is then the kind of uh, the peace of mind that you have when you go to hsbc.co.uk, icicibank.com, or even let's say facebook.com where you are posting your pictures, right? You have that peace of mind that you are actually interacting with Facebook or you are actually interacting with HSBC. You are putting your, uh, say, credit card details uh, when you are shopping at Next, right? Or you are shopping at MX, whatever uh, e-shopping we are doing, or Mintra.com, right? So because we have that peace of mind that the server with which we are talking is the right server. It's actually not a hacker, right? So this is what a PKI gives us. So the PKI, it's a set of technologies and protocols. Very important. Protocol is nothing but a set of rules. 
which is used to secure the online communication. So you can say it is a form of internet encryption. And it is how a web browser communicates to the web servers. So as I said, if PKI was not there, maybe today we wouldn't be doing online shopping or maybe today we wouldn't be doing transactions online, right? So PKI is based on asymmetric cryptography. Now you can imagine why we studied asymmetric cryptography, right? Because if we hadn't studied asymmetric cryptography, we wouldn't have understood the importance of PKI or how PKI works. And by now, I think everybody who's watching this video can raise their hand and say, I know asymmetric cryptography. Asymmetric cryptography means that you are using, yes, you are using a public and a private key pair. It could be used either for encrypting or for decrypting. I always tell, you can either encrypt using a public key and decrypt via private key, or you could encrypt via private key and decrypt via public key. So it's always these kind of use cases which are there. Very important things, and we'll learn about these as we go forward. The main components of a PKI, and these are the new terminologies that you'd be learning, are CAs. We call them certificate authorities, a CA, right? And uh, the other thing is uh, we learn about digital certificates. Now we talked a lot about digital signatures, how these digital signatures were happening. You were signing with your private key, you were sending it across, and then uh, it will, you were using the public key to, uh, to get uh, the message back, right? So that is the digital signature. But here we will learn digital certificates. And always remember, these digital certificates are issued for the servers. So as a client, you won't go and get digital certificates. It's always the servers. So what it wants to say is, yes, I am facebook.com or I am uh, icicibank.com. So it is the responsibility of the server to have the right certificates or uh, digitally signed certificates, we can call it. Right, then we have something called CRLs. This is Certificate Revocation Lists. And we have the registration authorities, the RAs. Let's take a look. So a CA, CA is responsible for issuing the digital certificate, right? So CA stands for uh, a Certificate Authority, right? So what I'm saying is that a CA is responsible for issuing digital certificate. So think about it as an organization which is issuing digital certificates, right? So there's a concept called digital certificate, but there's a body, there's, it's an organization or a body which is actually issuing these digital certificates. So one of the biggest CAs is DigiCert. You, you will learn about it and you'll see, we will see in another video, uh, we'll, we'll go through the, their website, we see what kind of services they are offering. Uh, then there is another big CA called Commodo, right? These are like big names uh, from where the servers get their digital certificates. So a CA is responsible for issuing the digital certificate, which are used to verify the identity of the entity in the online transaction. Now, a very important point, the digital certificate contains the identity of the entity, right? When I say entity, this is, let's say, your Facebook, right? Or your ICICI or your HSBC, right? That's what we are saying. So digital certificate will contain the identity of the entity being verified as well as its public key. So HSBC will be putting their own public key inside that digital certificate or that certificate which is then signed by the private key of the CA. Very important. So you see how, how closely knit this thing uh, is, that the digital certificate contains identity. So because how would you uh, then identify or how would make sure that you are actually facebook.com? You're not a hacker.com, right? You're not a hacker sitting somewhere and uh, imitating as Facebook. So digital certificate contains the identity of the uh, entity, I'm also putting my public key and we will see in an example how this whole thing works. And the certificate is signed by the CA to ensure its authenticity. So we learned about CRL, but what is a CRL? So CRLs are nothing but the list of digital certificates that have been revoked. 
So you just put in your digital, uh, in your uh, uh, certificate, you put all the list of all the digital certificates that have been revoked so that they can't be used. Oh, very important point is RA. Now, uh, to understand RA, just think is, uh, about it that CA is the big organization which is actually issuing certificates to people. But what it has done is that it has delegated the checking to the RA. So RA is responsible for verifying the identity. So let's say if today I'm cloudalchemy.com, I go to uh, a CA, I can't just simply go to the CA and ask them to, for the certificate. What they'll say is, first, go to, uh, the, first it, the request goes to the RA, RA will verify me, RA will verify, okay, I am cloudalchemy.com, this is my website, or this is, the, this is my web address, and this is where I'm hosted, all these details will be there, right? Um, my entire information will be there. My digital, ch uh, my checks will be done, right? I, it would be checked that I am the right person. It's not somebody is uh, coming and saying that I am Cloud Alchemy or I am Facebook.com, right? So RA is responsible for verifying the identity. Very important. Identity is the key word here, right? You are identifying yourself. It's like sh sh showing my driving license or showing my passport. Yes, I am the same person, right? Uh, and of entities requesting digital certificate and forwarding the certificate request to the appropriate CA. So once uh, the RA uh, sees that, yes, it's all good, it sends the request back to the, sorry, it sends the request back to the CA or the certificate authority saying that, yes, you can now go ahead and issue the certificate to this person. Okay, so PKI infrastructure, as I said, can help to provide secure communication by ensuring authenticity and integrity of data. So it's it's a combination, it's a culmination of encryption as well as uh, the, the digital signatures that we learned. So it says, and I said, it's a backbone. It's the backbone of how secure communication takes place over the internet, right? So you are getting authentication, you are getting integrity, uh, and it helps you to provide confidentiality through encryption, right? Okay, so uh, that's uh, pretty much, uh, I'd say, with PKI. And uh, very important concept, guys. Keep in mind, whatever we learned with encryption, we are going to apply the same knowledge. And these are more advanced topics we'll be learning. A lot of things will be repeated, but it is important to get good understanding of your PKI or the public key infrastructure. Thanks for watching. Okay, so another very important concept that we should learn with PKI is hashing. So you might have uh, seen in one of the previous videos, we talked about hashing when we were uh, describing encryption as well. But what exactly is hashing? So let's take a look at good details. So let's get our pen out and let's take a look. What is hashing? So hashing is a cryptographic technique which is used to transform the data of any size into a fixed length output, which we call the hash, right? So it is fixed length output. So if you, if you see here, if your input is fox, if your input is the red fox jumps over the blue dog, if your input is the red fox jumps something they have changed from over to O-U-V-R and the blue dog, you'll see that you will get always, first of all, you get always the fixed length output. It is always the fixed length output, right? If you see, if even if it is just three characters or there are 10 characters or 20 characters, it's the output is always fixed length. The another key uh, important thing you no need to notice here is that the value that you are getting. So here the red fox jumps over the blue dog and here the red fox jumps. Just small modification. If you see this V has been changed to a U and you will see that you get all together a different output. That is what is the beauty of hashing, right? So cryptographic technique, which is used to transform the data of any size into a fixed length output. Now, um, the hash function takes the input data and produces the hash that is unique to the specific input. So very important. So here you have the plain text, right? 
you take that plain text through a algorithm, right? And this algorithm we call the hashing function, right? So this hashing function then generates a hash or a hash text, and this is called a digest, and we will, we will see further. So a hash function, is, as you see here, this is my hash function. It is taking the input, right? It is taking the input data and producing a hash that is unique to the specific input. The most commonly used uh, cryptographic hash functions are SHA-256, SHA-384, SHA-512. Very popular algorithm. You'll see uh, the hash function, which is SHA-256. Hashing is commonly used in digital signatures. So now you might remember when we did videos on digital signatures, we talked about hashing. But here we are doing a more deep dive on hashing. What exactly is hashing, right? So hashing is commonly used in digital signatures, password storages, and data integrity checks, right? You just need to ensure that your data is not tempered. As you can see, if I just simply change a V to a U and rest of the text is same, still I get a different digest, right? The output of a hash function is referred to the message digest. So this output that we are getting is called a message digest, right? So we say it is a message digest. And the process of producing a hash from the input data is called hashing. As you see, I'm taking input data, I'm passing it through a hash function, I'm getting an output, and that output is called a digest. And that function that we are using, and this whole process is known as hashing. So easy. Okay, very, very, very important point. Always remember, guys, hash functions are one-way functions. It is a one-way street. You can always go from here to here, but you can't go from here back to here. So basically, you can't take a message digest, pass it through the hash function to get the actual plain text. It doesn't work. So hash functions are one-way functions, meaning that it is virtually impossible to reverse engineer the original input data. So as I said, you can't take this hash digest or hash text or message digest pass it back through the hash function to get your plain text. That doesn't work at all. It won't work. The size of the output hash is fixed and is usually much smaller than the input data, making it easy to store and transfer. Because the biggest challenge in, in internet is, is, is sending the message or the data package, right? So that is where uh, they came up with an idea that instead of using this whole encryption on uh, the message itself, why don't we do it on the digest? Because which is much smaller. And as I said, it is a fixed size. The size of the output is fixed. So even if here I'm having Fox or here I'm having a big uh, text, the digest size is still the same. Because small change in the input data can result in drastically different hash output, hashes are often used for detecting tampering or changes to the data. Perfect example we have got here, right? Here, some hacker came and he or she changed the V to a U, thinking that the other side won't come to know, right? Because if you just read uh, quickly, you might say, oh, it looks quite similar. No, because if you see, the digest has changed. So this digest is different from this digest. And that is the whole base of hashing that if even if you make a small change somewhere, even if you put a, a, a space bar somewhere or, or a space or, or some character somewhere, your digest will simply change, which will tell the uh, end user that yes, this message has been tampered. So very important guys, we learned about hashing. Thanks for watching. Okay, so after learning what is uh, hashing, it's time to take a look into a demo for hashing. It's a very, very simple demo. In this, what we will do is, first of all, we'll create a file which is called hello.txt. In that hello.txt, we'll just uh, enter uh, some um, words. We'll say hello world. We'll use a hashing function and get the digest of that. So uh, the command for that is OpenSSL digest minus SHA-256. So SHA-256, as we uh, know by now, is the algorithm we are using. And we are passing the message or the file as hello.txt. So all we are asking the hash function is, hey, uh, hash function, I'm giving you this uh, message. Can you please create a digest for me? 
So as you know, it would actually create a long alpha um, kind of a hexadecimal um, uh, digest for you. And then what we will do is we will try uh, to replicate if let's say a hacker tries to change the digest or if, if the um, hacker tries to change the actual message, right? So in this case, what we'll do is we'll modify the contents of the file and we'll just simply give one space, one space after hello world. And we'll see that the hash function will automatically generate a new digest. So if you are getting a new digest, automatically you will come to know that, hey, somebody has tempered my original message because you have the uh, original digest with you. And ideally you would have compared that digest with the new digest, but if the new digest is changed, it means somebody has tempered your message. So that's the beauty of hashing. So let's take a look. So first we need to uh, uh, create a file called hello.txt. So I just do a vi hello.txt and in that I'll just simply say hello world right I save it and then I will use uh, the command and you guys can actually work with me on this simple command we are giving we are just saying open SSL digest DGST minus SHA-256 hello.txt right perfect so what has what it has done it has actually given us a digest right this this uh, alphanumeric um, output is is there which we call the digest or the message digest right now what i'll do is i'll temper this a bit and i'll change hello.txt to just enter a to enter additional character in this right so i've added a character here and if i say save it and let's try and create a digest back on that Perfect. So just have a look. So it's automatically generated a new digest. So as I told you that even if you put a space, you put a dot. So if your original message is tempered, then automatically the hashing algorithm will give you, give you a new digest. So from here, you can easily compare that my original message digest was this, but now it, this is this. So it means that when the message came to me, somebody or a man in the middle has tampered with it. And that's why I'm getting a new digest. So guys, this shows the importance of hashing algorithm. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So after having a look at uh, the hashing or what a hashing algorithm is or what is a hash function, it's time to lick, I'll take a look at message digest. So we did um, uh, actually um, talk about in uh, mesh, uh, the message digest in the previous video as well, but this is a more uh, detailed one and a deep dive, I'd say. So I won't repeat myself, otherwise uh, the students would say uh, he's really re um, uh, repeating the stuff, but yeah, we'll, we'll just see uh, how it goes. So yes, um, what is a message digest? So as you can see, this is a message of any arbitrary length. As you can see, you have Fox, you have all these messages. And when you pass it through a hash function like SHA-256 or SHA-512, you get an output, which is a message digest. And this is like something like in this form, right? So all it says is it's a fixed length output produced by a cryptographic hash function when given an input message. The message digest is also sometimes known as is referred to as a hash value or checksum. So uh, what you are getting in some te uh, terminologies, we also call it the checksum that what is your checksum, right? So the it's the same thing. We call it hash value or checksum. Message digests are commonly used in cryptography to provide data integrity and authentication. So how you are getting uh, this data integrity and authentication, if you can see, there's a small change here a v is being ch uh, changed or tampered to a u and you will see that right away you will have a different value of your digest so this is how you uh, come to know whether uh, somebody has tampered your message right a message digest is a unique representation of the input message right again it's it's uh, repeating ourselves we are saying that it is a unique representation and any small change right any small change in the message uh, will result in a different message digest, as we saw here, right? The size of the message digest is typically uh, much smaller. So if you see, uh, if I keep on adding text here, if I have, uh, let's say, a big document, even then my message digest size would be the same. So the size of the message digest is typically much smaller than the original message. Um, uh, I think we, we already learned uh, that this is a one-way street. You can go from here to here, but you can't go from here to here, right? 
from a message digest, you can't derive your original message. So it's a cryptographic hash functions used to generate the message digest are de designed to be one way functions, meaning it is invisible to recover the original message. So you can't get your original message back. The signer generates a message digest of the document they want to sign and then signs the digest rather than the entire document. Very, very, very important point. I would say, please, please bookmark this point. And this is the most important point of this slide that you, the signer never signs the actual message. You always sign the digest. And we will see in, in, uh, in the next um, uh, coming videos that you are not signing the message. Remember guys, you are signing the digest and how you're getting a digest, you take the message, put push, uh, push it through the SHA function and get the output and then you sign it, right? So, and message digest, as we um, uh, already saw uh, several use cases, they can also be used for password storage where message digest of a password is stored instead of password itself. So uh, like uh, we, you would have seen an Oracle database, like um, the Oracle database will never store the password itself, but it actually stores the message digest, right? Very important. So uh, the most commonly used uh, message digest algorithms are, uh, we already um, uh, had a look, but what is SHA? SHA stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. SHA, Secure S Hash H and Algorithm A, which includes the SHA 1, 2, 5, 6. So the, these are like most common and popular ones. So message digests are important tool in cryptography for ensuring data integrity and authenticity. So I've already talked about these concepts for a, a, a lot of times. So all you're getting with message digest is your data integrity and authenticity. So with this, uh, we actually learned what is um, a hashing algorithm, what is hashing, what are message digests. So thanks for watching. Okay, so it's time to take a look at another key artifact of PKI or the public key infrastructure, which is digital signatures. Now, we've actually, you must have heard a lot about digital signatures. Every time people say that uh, I would like you to digitally sign this document or you're using digital signature here, but what is a digital signature, right? So a digital signature is nothing but a mathematical technique which is used to verify the authenticity and integrity of the digital document or the message. Very important, right? So what it is saying is two things are most important for digital signature. Authenticity, that you are the right person, right? If I am signing this document, then it is me who has signed the document, right? And it is not somebody else who has signed the document. So that shows authenticity. Second is integrity. What it means is that the message has not been tempered. So when the message goes from the sender to the receiver, the contents of the message hasn't changed. That is what will give you integrity. So that is what a digital signature is all about. It's a mathematical technique which used to verify the authenticity and integrity of the digital documents or messages. So as you can see here, you have a message, you are signing that with your private key. But remember I told you, you always sign the message digest. And how do you get the message digest? You use the uh, text or the input text, apply the uh, function or the hashing function to get the digest. And then you sign it uh, using your private key. Always remember you are signing with your private key and you are verifying with the public key, right? So it is created by using a private key to encrypt a document or message and can only be decrypted by the corresponding public key. This is what we are showing here, that you are encrypting with a private key and you are decrypting with a public key. As I said, because it's all about integrity, you always encrypt not with the public key, but with the private key, because you want to ensure that you are the person who's actually sending that document and that document hasn't been tampered. It provides a way to ensure that the content of the digital document has not been tempered. And we'll take a look in um, in a more uh, workflow uh, diagram. We'll, we'll show how uh, this uh, digital signature takes place. But all we are ensuring is that the message has not been tempered. And uh, digital signatures are commonly used to authenticate the electronic documents, uh, such as contracts. So uh, whenever, let's say, you are uh, signing a contract with your solicitors, right? They will ask you to digitally sign that uh, document. 
uh, several agreements if you're making, especially with legal and financial documents, the digital signatures are very important. Thanks for watching. Okay, so it's time to take a look at how digital signatures work under the hood, right? So till now, we got good understanding about what are digital signatures. But now in this video, we will see how you can actually uh, make use of digital signatures in a practical situation, right? So here we are talking about uh, two people, Joy and Aileen. Now just think about it that Joy has to send a legal document and digitally sign and Aileen is her solicitor. So here we are talking about a digital uh, document or a, a, an important legal document that has to be digitally signed and sent over to the solicitor. So let's see how, how it goes, right? So the first thing is, um, as we are talking about uh, asymmetric encryption, as we've learned, um, so here you have a public-private key pair for Joy, you have public-private key pair for Aileen, although they won't come in use, but yeah, we'll see. Right, so as I told you, and what we've learned in previous lessons is that the message always passes through a hashing algorithm, right? So in this, the hashing algorithm that we are using is a SHA-256, so the message passes through a hashing algorithm and what do you get? Any guesses? Yes, you get a message digest or you can also call it as a checksum. So sometimes we call this as a checksum or a message digest, right? So now you got your message digest as this, this thing, right? And I told you that if you change hello to cello or, or if you remove the H or put a uh, say a space uh, somewhere, you're automatically the message digest would change. Okay, all good till now. The second thing I told you guys was that whenever you are doing encryption, you always encrypt the message digest and never the message. Because message is quite big, it could be a lot of pages and all, so you're not doing that. So first we create a digest and then we encrypt it. Because here we are talking about digital signatures and the most important thing in digital signature is the authenticity and integrity. What it means is that Joe is the right person who's sending it. It's not a hacker who's signing the document, the legal documents and sending over to the solicitor, right? So it's very important that the authenticity and integrity is maintained and that's why any guesses, yes, you will use or Joy will use his own private key or secret key to encrypt this much digest. And yes, what do we get? A digital signature. So it is as simple as that, right? So till now you guys must have been getting confused of what is a digital signature, how it works, but this is how you get the digital signature. Now what happens from here on? So from here on, you will take the message and you will apply this digital signature and send it over to Aileen. Now when Aileen receives, receives it, um, she needs to decrypt this. So she needs to uh, check it internally that you are the right person or is it is it actually being sent by Joy or somebody has actually tampered it and signed uh, as a hacker and sending it over to Aileen. So what um, uh, Aileen does, because this message digest or was encrypted using Joy's private key, there is only and only one key in the whole world which can decrypt it. Any guesses? Yes, it is Joy's own public key. So this is Joy's public key because it is publicly available. So Aileen can apply Joy's public key onto the di message digest and what does she get? She gets the message digest back. Right, so that's the beauty. So now you get the message and you get the message digest, but it doesn't end here. From here, uh, Aileen doesn't know whether the message has been tempered even now. So what Aileen will do is, Aileen will take this whole document and pass it through the SHA algorithm, right? So Aileen will pass this message through the SHA algorithm and what does she get? She gets the message digest, right? And the good thing is now Aileen is able to compare, oh yes, this is what I have received and this what the message is giving me as a message digest. And both of these are equal, which indicates perfect. It indicates authenticity and integrity. That is, Joy is the right person who is sending me this message and in integrity because the message hasn't been tempered. I'm getting the same value of the message digest, which was there in my um, in in the message itself, right? 
So this is how the whole digital signature works under the hood. I hope you liked the video. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So we are learning PKI or the public key infrastructure. And one of the key pillars of uh, the PKI is the CA or the Certificate Authority. Now, what exactly is a Certificate Authority? So before we actually go into more details of Certificate Authority, I normally say that it's the best diagram to actually understand how a CA works. So just think about it and that you are the applicant and here is a Certificate Authority. So when we are talking about the applicant, we can say this is something like a Facebook.com, right? So when Facebook would have established, it would have come up with its own website, its domain, everything, right? And the CA here, we are talking about a big CA, something like a DigiCert, right? So let's say you are coming up or, or you it's a Cloud Alchemy or any, any of your organizations, right? So how does a, a server uh, or an organization request for a CA? Uh, it's it's uh, for a certificate, right? So what happens is first of all, you need to have your identifying information Now, when I say identifying information If it is a website, you will actually give the website URL you will give the domain name you will give the organization name um, uh, Say address of that organization. So anything that identifies you as an entity has to be sent over in a CSR this is called a CSR which is a certificate signing request now it's very important that when you send your CSR, it you need to uh, place your public key inside this CSR, right? So you are having your um, say identity information related to your identity, so that uh, the certificate authority can know. Okay, you are applying for it. You are Facebook.com. This is your domain address. This is your organization. This is your actual address. All that stuff, and you also key in your uh, public key. So this information then goes over to the CA, right? So it comes to the CA. Uh, now CA, as I told you, is is the top authority. So the uh, who takes care of uh, the uh, the actual identity information or checking the identity? It is the RA, right? So the RA will take care of uh, your uh, all the identities and also it is the RA. We will learned about that in the in the previous uh, lesson. So RA will go and check uh, your identities. Okay, are you uh, the uh, are you uh, Facebook.com? Do you have this domain registered against you? All that stuff. When RA says um, that's all good, then SEA can go ahead and issue the certificate. But most important thing here is that when the um, CA issues the certificate, it actually signs that certificate with its own private key. So please don't get confused. As an applicant, as a, as a server, you put your public key. But when the signing is done, signing is always done with the private key. So here this, this uh, certificate authority uh, or the CA will sign using its own private key and send it over back to the applicant. So now let's take a look. So what is a CA? So a CA is nothing but a trusted third party organization that issues digital certificates, right? So you are issuing uh, digital certificates to individuals, organizations, devices. Um, CAs are responsible for, for verifying the identity of the entity. So as I told you, if you are saying you are facebook.com, CA will actually check. So it's not the CA, but actually the RA. But anyways, it's, it's underneath the CA, right? So uh, it will check your identity. If you are saying you are Facebook, are you actually Facebook or not? Right. The main role of CA is to establish a trust. So this trust that is uh, trust that is being established between who the client and the server. Right. So that's why when you are going to Facebook.com, HSBC.com, uh, you are trusting that um, uh, server. Uh, you trust HSBC.com that if I'm going to make any transactions on that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that nothing is, is uh, going to the hackers. It's actually going uh, to the databases of HSBC, right? So, but main role of CA is to ensure that this trust is built between the two parties that can um, share information, right? So we always say that there is a root CA. There's a concept of a root CA and intermediate CA. So the root CA is the top of the hierarchy and responsible for issuing uh, the intermediate CAs, right? So an intermediate CAs are the ones who actually issue the certificates. And you will always see that we will see in an example as well, the root CAs are normally self-signed certificates, right? So uh, they don't, the root CA doesn't have to go to a signing authority to get its, uh, the certificate signed. 
the intermediate CA has to get it signed by the root CA. So it's always remember root CA is at the top of hierarchy and responsible for issuing intermediate CAs, which in turn issue the certificate. And root CAs are typically owned by government agencies, large, large corporations, like I told you, like DigiCert, Commodore. They, these are like some of the big names uh, in the industry, which are actually used as uh, CAs. So intermediate CAs are owned by organizations such as commercial CAs, universities, large corporations, issue certificates. So intermediate cert certificates come at a uh, slightly lower level. Root CAs are more uh, kind of big organizations, you can call it. And they are also uh, responsible for revoking certificates that have been compromised. So there can be uh, things that certain uh, see uh, certain certificates ha could have been expired. They could have been hacked. So they maintain a list of that. And that is, this is what we learned previously, the CRLs, the certificate revocation lists. So CA is responsible for revoking the certificates that have been compromised, right? So always remember that. And digital certificates issued by CA are used in various applications, such as secure web browsing. When you, whenever you do HTTPS, it means you are going doing a secure web browser. Uh, email encryption, uh, the um, MIME uh, concept, and the virtual private network. So, uh, wherever we are talking about, um, say, a secure connectivity between client and server, uh, you will always talk about uh, the uh, certificates. And I normally say that whenever we say uh, data in transit encryption, right? When we are, whenever she is saying that the the tr data uh, in transit, like when you are sending the data from client to server, that is encrypted in that there would somewhere be a concept of certificate somewhere. And whenever there is a concept of certificates, there will always be some root CA or a certificate authority sitting on top, which would be issuing the certificates. So remember, the uh, certificate authority is a trusted third party organization which issues digital certificates. In the next video, we will take a look at what exactly are digital certificates and we'll do more uh, under the hood uh, analysis of digital certificates. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So in this video, I actually want to show you the real CA or the certificate authority, right? So I talked a lot about what are CAs, what is a certificate authority, how do you get it signed? But I really wanted that in one video, I'm able to showcase a real world CA and that is DigiCert, right? It is one of the biggest CAs in, in today's world. So if you, if you read it, it says from early web CA to today's extension of digital trust, through entire ecosystem, we secure the threads and keep the real world running, right? As I told you that it is the backbone of e-commerce, right? How, how you trust, um, say, hsbc.com or facebook.com. But uh, if you want to actually have a look, it's a very good, um, uh, uh, say, a page that they have created, which shows the entire history of um, DigiCert. DigiCert was not actually DigiCert. So it all started in 1995 when it was called VeriSign. So VeriSign was a very first certificate authority. And um, a lot of guys, uh, <clears throat> if they um, go back to the past, they might uh, remember this name called VeriSign, right? So 1995, it was called VeriSign. And then DigiCert was founded uh, based on SSL because uh, in 2003, they founded it as DigiCert. In uh, 2005, they say that DigiCert became a founding member of the CA or the browser forum, right? It's, it's all it's all given here. Then few interesting bits come. In 2007, DigiCert partners with Microsoft to develop the industry's first multi-domain certificate. If you see, it's a multi-domain certificate that they created. And another interesting bit comes in 2010, Symantec. Actually, you, you might remember Symantec with Norton Antivirus and also Symantec actually acquired VeriSign authentication and rebranded the iconic trust seal. So it was actually called Norton Secured Powered by DigiCert, right? If you go further down, you'll see in 2013, DigiCert became the industry's first CC log, which was actually accepted by Google. Few more changes came. 2015, DigiCert launched the scalable platform to secure IoT devices. So IoT is nothing but Internet of Things, we call it. And 2016, see uh, think how uh, changes are happening. Digi DigiCert introduces a digital identity for drones that are based on proven PKI standards, right? So now you can uh, see what we are learning, PKI. So all this is getting um, implied here. 
Then 2017, actually, following the um, Symantec distrust, so this distrust happened with Symantec, DigiCert acquired Symantec uh, website security business and reissues all certificates on DigiCert's trusted routes. So from this point onwards, in 2017 onwards, um, DigiCert became the actual authority. Right. So then in 2019, DigiCert acquires QWADIS, the leading uh, qualified trust service provider in EU and Switzerland. So they, they, they've been expanding a lot. And 2020, it was DigiCert announces a DigiCert 1, which is a holistic approach to PKI management. So I, I, wh why I'm showing you all this is because what we are learning, what we are learning, we are learning PKI, we are learning CAs, certificate authorities. And this is a real world uh, scenario that I'm showing you in front of you. So thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So we have uh, talked about digital certificates quite a lot, right? So in the previous video also, we talked about the CAs, what is a certificate authority? What is an RA or registration authority? And all these CAs are actually issuing you a digital certificate, right? But what exactly is a digital certificate? So let's take a look. So a digital certificate is nothing but a digital document which is used to verify the identity of an entity or person online, right? Again, taking the example of facebook.com, when you are going to facebook.com, the digital certificate of that server or that web server is ensuring that it is really facebook.com. So it's basically a digital document which is verifying the identity of the person. Now, if, if I take you back to the example of um, certificate authorities, where we learned about CAs and what is a CA, I told you that it actually starts with a CSR, which is a certificate uh, request that you raise, certificate signing request that uh, an entity raises or a web server raises. So in that you have all the uh, details about the identity, like if you are facebook.com, what is your domain name? What is the URL? What is your address? All those details go in that. So that's why we say digital certificate is a digital document which verifies your identity. Right? It contains the information about the owner of the certificate, such as name, address, and public key. Again, if I take you back to that example where, I, where we showed you that uh, how a CSR travels uh, or goes to the CA, I told you that first all the identity information goes into the CSR and then you have to put or seed your public key inside that certificate's request. And when the CA signs, the CA signs with it. Any guesses? Yes the private key. So all the second point says is it contains information about the owner of the certificate like facebook.com, their name, their address, their domain, along with their public key. Next, the certificate is issued by a trusted third party organization, CA, very um, self-explanatory. We already learned that there are so many CAs available in the market. The topmost I showed you is DigiCert, right? So the certificate that request that we are se uh, sending is actually signed by a trusted third party organization. So the CA actually verifies the identity, but it's not actually the CA, but it is actually an RA which we call the registration authority, which will actually check whether if you are saying you are facebook.com, it will go and check, okay, is the domain registered against you? Are you giving the right information? Do you have the right uh, address? So it uh, it goes through a process of validation, right? As, as it says, it includes checking legal documents, conducting background checks, and verifying the domain ownership. So a lot, a lot of all these checks are done uh, by the CA. Or, or the RA, you can say, and based on that, the CA then issues the certificate. So once the CA has verified the identity of the certificate owner, they issue the certificate and sign it with their own digital signature, indicating that it can be trusted. Now, uh, if, if we talk about this line, uh, very important, which it says is signed with its own digital signature, right? So I told you that a CA signs with its private key. So CA will always sign with its private key on the CSR that it has received. Right? So digital certificates are commonly used in e-commerce, online banking, and other applications where secure communication and data transfer is important. So uh, it's, it's uh, as, as we talked about it, uh, earlier, it's all about 
forming a trust between a client and a server, right? So we wouldn't be shopping, uh, doing online shopping on Amazon, or we wouldn't be uh, posting videos or, or our photographs, personal photographs on Facebook if we wouldn't have trusted these. So this trust, the trust that is brought is brought by a CA or a digital certificate. Um, so yeah, the use of digital certificates helps uh, prevent fraud, hacking, and other types of cyber crime by ensuring that only th trusted parties can access sensitive information. So it's, it's again the same thing. Because of digital certificate, we can trust that facebook.com is really facebook.com or amazon.co.uk is actually Amazon. I can go and shop. I can give my Amex card details. I can put my credit card details uh, without worrying about anything. So. Guys, very important. We in this video, we uh, had a look at what is a digital certificate. In the next video, we will actually go and check at a real world digital certificate, how digital certificates look like. I, I would I'd like to do a demo or a practical of, of how digital certificates look like. Thanks for watching. So in the previous videos, we saw what a digital certificate is, right? We also had a look at what is a CA or a certificate authority. We had a look what is an RA or a registration authority. So all these things we have studied. But in this video, what I want to do is I want to do a kind of under the hood digital certificate, how it actually would work in a real world scenario. So let's say uh, I take my example here. I'm actually um, coming up with a new website or a new domain, you can say it is Cloud Alchemy Academy, where, where I'm, I'm actually creating all my courses anyways. So I, um, as, as a web server, let's say I have got my uh, public key as well as private key. So this is my public key and this is my secret key. So if we go further, the first thing that we need to do and we have learned so far is we start with a certificate signing request, a CSR, right? So what does, how does the CSR look like? So a CSR, as I told you, will have my identity, right? Two things. It will always have my identity and it will have my uh, uh, public key, right? So public key would be embedded in my CSR. So uh, in terms of identity, as I said, uh, it will be all the details. What is my website um, URL? What is the domain? Uh, where am I registered? All this stuff. So if you see name is cloudalchemy.uk uh, organization, let's say uh, Cloud Alchemy Limited and the country is UK, right? Now this CSR has to go to a certificate authority, something like a DigiCert, right? So um, you can just imagine in terms of, okay, there are intermediate CAs and there is root CA, but to generalize it, I would say it will actually go to a, a, digi, um, to, to a certificate authority. And the first thing that a CA or an RA would do is scrutiny. They would check just like a detective, as you can see here, they would actually check whether I am really cloudalchemy.uk or I'm some hacker who's trying to pretend to be a cloudalchemy.uk, right? So they will be checking my identity and they will be looking at this uh, CSR. And once they are happy with whole, uh, this whole thing, they would say, okay, yes, I can stamp it. And they will stamp it with their or encrypt it with their private key. So the CA will encrypt or place its private key to generate a digital certificate. So this is how a digital certificate of Cloud Alchemy UK would look like. So whenever a, a client sends a request to uh, the uh, Cloud Alchemy UK, this is the uh, uh, this is the certificate that would be passed back to uh, the client, right? So always remember when you're doing facebook.com, uh, you're doing amazon.co.uk, on your web browser, you send a request to the web server and the web server actually sends the certificate back. So another key important thing always to remember, people um, uh, tell you that in the TLS handshake or when this handshake takes place between client and server, the server sends the public key. No, the server never sends the public key. The server always sends the digital certificate. Always remember the server will always send you the digital certificate, never sends the public key. So this is how uh, your uh, certificate looks like under the hood. I think by now you've got a very, very good understanding of what a digital certificate is, what is a CA, what is a root CA, how this whole thing of getting the uh, uh, the stamp or uh, from or getting the authorities from CAs uh, works in the real world.
So thanks for watching guys. Welcome to an interesting demo on digital certificates. Here we will actually do a scrutiny of a real word certificate, right? So how, how does it work? So let's take a look. So if you go to facebook.com, you will always see that there is a padlock. If you are getting a padlock, it means that you are on HTTPS or you can say it is a secure uh, communication that is going to happen. So if you click on this, you will see and it'll, I'll actually read out for you because it's very important. Whatever we have learned so far, we are going to apply the same knowledge. So it says Safari is using an encrypted connection to Facebook.com. Good. So it means that you can trust this this uh, connection or, or this this server itself. It says encryption with digital certificate. So there are two things you are using encryption, what we have already learned. You are using digital certificates, which we have learned as well. We'll keep the information private as it's sent to and from the, the website. So what it means is that whatever communication is happening between the client and the server, there is no man in the middle coming here. It's all encrypted connection, right? So you can just go ahead. You can post your uh, videos. You can post your photographs. Or if you are on Amazon.co.uk, you can easily go and do your shopping. But let's take a look at this certificate, how this certificate looks like. Amazing. So this is how the certificate looks like. Like, OK, so let's take a look. So what it first of all, we need to understand this bit. The, the first bit is that Facebook.com certificate has been signed by DigiCert SHA-2 High Assurance Server CA, which is an intermediate CA. So if you see here, it says intermediate CA. And then this has this certificate has been signed by DigiCert, the, the one that we looked at. And this is the root CA. If you see, it says root certificate authority. Perfect. So now uh, th this is what we talked about root CA, intermediate CA and the actual requester. So Facebook is the requester. This goes to intermediate CA, which would have taken a look at Facebook's identity, uh, the domain name, whatever information they gave. And then when a green signal was given, the root CA signed it. And always remember root CA always signs its own certificate. It has got that authority. So uh, if we look at uh, Facebook.com, if we start looking at the details, so what are the contents of it? Let's let's take a look. The first thing is, uh, as, I, as I said, the first thing is always the identity, what it is. So it will tell about, OK, country or region is US, uh, country, uh, county is California, locality is Menlo Park, organization is Meta Platforms and common name is Facebook.com. So this is all the information that Facebook.com would have given and much more to prove its identity that, yes, I am Facebook.com. Right. Then it gives the details of the issuer name. Issuer name, if you understand, is the intermediate CA. So the intermediate CA here is DigiCert SHA-2 High Assurance Server CA. Now the details of that, it shows issuer name, country, account, country origin is US. Organization is DigiCert. We already uh, had a look. Uh, organization unit is DigiCert.com. I already showed you the website of that. So the common name that you use is this one. The serial number, like you can say a unique number is this. The version is this. And guys, just have a look. What kind of encryption are they using and the signature algorithm they are using? SHA-256 with RSA encryption. Everything that we have learned so far, everything. We learned about these hashing algorithms. We learned about at depth, in depth uh, RSA encryption. So everything is in front of you. Now it would become so easy. Then I also told you that every CA or every certificate would have some public uh, uh, public key uh, information as well. And just have a look at the algorithms they are using. Elliptical curve public key, elliptical curve um, uh, uh, security p um, key. Then you have the public key details. If I click on this, you'll see that the entire public key, the key size the key usage signature. So whatever we learned, we, we learned all these. So this is all in front of you now. And rest are more about extensions. You can actually go about and read about it. So again, if I go up uh, and uh, try and see the details of who's the signing authority, who's the intermediate CA here, it is the SHA-2 assurance. And here again, um, just the details about it. And important thing is that the this certificate for uh, SHA-2 has actually been signed by the root CA. So if you see, 
the common name is DigiCert High Assurance Root CA as part of the issuer. And rest of the details are, are same like signature algorithm, SHA-256 with RSA and, and all this rest of the information. Now, if we actually take a look at um, Root CA, it's very interesting because I told you that Root CA is self-signed. So Root CA doesn't have to go to any uh, certificate authority to get the signature. It is, it is always self-signed. So if you see, the subject name is also DigiCert. Uh, the common name is DigiCert High Assurance EV Root CA and who is the issuer? If you look at the uh, Root CA, common name is same DigiCert High Assurance EV Root CA. So it means this is a self-signed certificate, but it is only the Root CA which can have self-signed certificate because if you again quickly take a look, if you look at the issu uh, issuers for Intermediate CA, you will see the common name was Intermediate CA's name and the issuer name was DigiCert root CA, right? And for Facebook.com, it was the issuer. So if you see common name was Facebook.com and the issuer name was higher assurance, right? So this is the kind of hierarchy it follows. And so I think uh, with this video, you will have got a very, very good understanding of what is a digital certificate, how it really looks like. Um, because when we are working on uh, all these things, we, we never imagined that it's so easy to look at and do a scrutiny of um, a digital certificate. So with this video, we did that. I hope you liked the video. Thanks for watching. Okay, so another interesting video is coming your way, guys. So here we will try and understand the benefits of a digital certificate or just try and understand the architecture, how a digital certificate is architected and how it actually prevents a man in the middle attack, right? So let's take a look. So here I'm talking about, let's say you have um, a digital certificate or there is a company called HSBC, it's a bank in the UK. Um, so let's say they have uh, actually created a digital certificate. They've gone to the CA and the CA has actually certified uh, the digital certificate with its own, uh, say, private key, right? So how it goes is um, that you have, uh, say, as we said, that every digital certificate would have its own identities, right? So, and uh, you will always embed your primary key, um, and your um, public key in it, right? So all we are saying is you have uh, uh, an organization, hsbc.co.uk, and um, its, its organization is HSBC, and the country is UK. And this is the digital certificate, uh, and this is your, let's say, the secret key, because it was signed by the, um, the, the CA, right? Now, as a client, what you are doing is you are requesting uh, access to the website. Let's say you are saying you are sitting on your web, web browser and from your web browser, you are requesting uh, HSBC, uh, hsbc.co.uk. So what a server does, as I told you, that a server never sends the public key back. The server always sends its digital certificate, right? So what HSBC would do, HSBC's web server will actually send its um, certificate back to the client, right? Now what happens? Let's say there is a smart hacker sitting somewhere in Russia and that hacker thinks, okay, let me grab this um, certificate. Let me create my own certificate and send it back to the client so that I start imitating like hsbc.co.uk, right? So what that guy will do, it'll just create a fake certificate. So the, the, again, that smart hacker is having his own um, uh, public key and secret key or the private key. And if you see, the, uh, the smart hacker will actually just imitate this certificate and create its own certificate something like a name is darkweb.com organization hcc country U russia and it will just try and uh, uh, try and send this certificate back to uh, the client who was actually requesting this certificate right so now you might think okay the request has gone to hsbc.co.uk in between there's a man in the middle sitting somewhere who's uh, taken that certificate which is coming back, made some changes in that and sending this back to the client because the client still see, uh, thinks that I'm talking to hsbc.com or hsbc.co.uk, but this man in the middle now grabs this certificate, changes it and sends it back. 
Now, what do you think happens? You might think, oh, uh, because I'm talking to hsbc.co.uk and if the, the man in the middle is uh, changing that certificate, sending it back to me, so I won't come to know. No, it doesn't happen like that. So this actually certificate comes and gets processed by the web browser. So you will have, let's say Google Chrome, you will have Safari, and you'll notice that all our web browsers always store some certificates as well. And the other th important thing is that why this certificate would not work is because as I told you that the CA or the uh, certificate authority uses its or signs and encrypts it with its own secret key. So which is the key in the whole world which can decrypt it? So you need to use the CA's public key. Now these web browsers are intelligent. They already know about all these um, uh, say and the CA's and the CA's public key. So the web browser tries to use the CA's public key and hey, there is a mismatch, right? Why? Because it's not able to um, it's not able to decrypt the, this this certificate in that sense because it has been used uh, or it has been encrypted by some other uh, private key. By this, it comes to know, hey, so somebody there is a man in the middle and what uh, it will do, it will very intelligently say, invalid cert server certificate and it sends a request back to the client saying no i can't open this um, this web page which darkweb.com that is sending me because it is an invalid certificate i need the certificate which has been sent uh, by or signed by the ca on the trusted authority because the whole concept is trust right this whole thing is based on trust. If you are not able to build that trust between the web browser and the web server, then it means the communication, the secure communication can't take place. So that is uh, why this video was so important because we wanted to showcase what is the benefit of digital certificate, how they are created, how they are organized and how even a man in the middle uh, can't do anything with these. So in the next video, we will actually take a look at what are self-signed certificates. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. In this video, we will talk about the self-signed certificates. So um, this is more of a theory, theory for self-signed certificates, but we did actually take a look at self-signed certificates. If you might remember when I was actually showing you the certificates of facebook.com. So when we did uh, the, uh, when we checked the certificate, so you had uh, the lower um, say level was facebook.com. Then on top of it, you had the intermediate CA. And then uh, at, at the uh, at the top uh, level was the top CA or we call the root CA. And I told you that the facebook.com will get its certificate signed by intermediate CA and this intermediate CA then in turn gets its certificate signed by the root CA. And always remember that root CA, there is no issuer on top of a root CA. So root CA can actually uh, self-sign its own certificate. But sometimes these self-signed uh, certificates can also be utilized. So let's take a look. So a self-signed certificate is nothing but a digital certificate that is created and signed by the same entity. Very important that you are actually signing. Uh, uh, so you're not actually going to any issuer or you're not going to a CA to get your certificate signed rather than being signed by a third party uh, CA, right? So very important that you are the person, uh, let's say if I, I am creating a certificate, I'm signing it myself. That, that is what we call the self-signed certificate. So which means I'm not actually going to a trusted CA or a certificate authority or a third party uh, trusted uh, CA to get the certificate signed. Now you might ask, why would I do that? Yes, normally people do that when they are building development environments, right? Quite important when you are building dev environments, you are you don't want to spend too much on getting these uh, signed certificates because they, they are expensive, right? So we say that normally in testing and development environments, uh, also sometimes in small scale de deployments, it may be um, practical to actually just use a self-signed certificate and not uh, go for a trusted CA. Right. So, but self-signed certificates are not considered as secure. Please remember they are not secure. The only secure way to get a digital certificate is through trusted CAs. 
right because why because they don't have the same level of validation right because we told you that uh, whenever you request for a certificate to the ca it has to go through a proper scrutiny right you might remember the the guy with the um, with the lens was checking it so so what, what it is doing it is actually uh, this trusted organization is actually checking for your identity right so that's why if you are using a self signed certificate we don't consider it very secure and uh, there are actually a lot of tools available and we will see in uh, in a demo as well how to create a self-signed certificate so self-signed certificates can be created using tools like open ssl very popular tool uh, in in the market and we will use uh, that uh, to showcase in a demo as well so you can use open ssl to create your self-signed certificates um very important the browsers i told you are very intelligent these days they are always looking for certificates right trusted certificates so whenever uh, you use a self signed certificate your browser will always display a warning it will indicate that the certificate you are using is not trusted do you really want to use it and you have to accept it so you manually accept the certificate in order to proceed right um, it is possible for att attackers to create fraudulent self-signed certificates, which can be used to conduct man-in-the-middle attacks. So we sh uh, showed you the HSBC example, right? In that example, if you remember, I took HSBC.co.uk uh, certificate and I used um, the, um, say, the hacker came in and changed it. Just imagine if that certificate was a self-signed certificate then what would have happened right so what would have happened is anybody would have changed it and uh, it would have been sent to the client and obviously the the browser wouldn't have come to know right because using a self-signed certificate and that's why the browser always gives you a warning message so always remember the self-signed certificates are always prone to uh, these um, attacks uh, from the uh, hackers right and uh, self-signed certificates normally have expiration uh, dates so they do expire after a while so and you need to renew it period periodically to remain uh, to maintain it valid but it's quite important right because they are not very secure so you you use it for only for temporary uh, time or temporary purposes and then they expire so they, they shouldn't be actually used uh, after that so uh, very important and um, what a self-signed certificate is so in the next demo um, i will actually show you how you can use or create your self-signed certificate thanks for watching okay so before we actually jump into the demos i thought it would be quite important if we um, actually discuss a couple of file formats which are very important uh, for you guys these are pem and pkcs 12. So now the certificates that we are creating or the digital certificates that we are creating can either be stored in a PEM or in, in a PKCS 12 format. So what exactly are these? Let's take a look. So PEM or PEM stands for Privacy Enhanced Mail. It is a base 64 encoded file format, right? So what does it mean? So a base 64 encoded file format represents the binary data into ASCII string. Now, very important that a PEM format is used to store digital certificates. You can store your private keys and you can even store other types of data such as the certificate revocation list. Now, what was the CRLs? I told you that there are certain certificates that have expired or can't be used. So, uh, so the trusted CA will always create this kind of list, which is called a certificate revocation list. Okay, now very important, another format is PKCS 12. A lot of people don't even uh, know the full form of PKCS and what it is. So PKCS stands for Public Key Cryptography Standards. PKCS, Public Key Cryptography Standards. And it is a binary file format. So very important, this was encoded, base64 encoded file format and this is a binary file format. And this is actually used to store digital certificates and private keys only two things always remember pkcs is storing digital certificates and private keys but it can be in a password protected file right always remember that so you are storing it is a binary file format which is used to store digital certificates and private keys in a password protected file very important 
Now, uh, if the guys who would have uh, worked on Oracle um, or when they're working on TDE, when they're storing their master encryption key, they always store it in a wallet. And this wallet is actually password protected. So it is, they are using a PKCS kind of format, right? So PKCS 12 files can also include additional files such as intermediate certificates and CA certificates, okay? So now uh, sometimes people ask, what are the key differences? I'm still getting confused. They say, what is the key difference between a PEM and a PKCS? So the very first difference is the encoding scheme, how, how the data is stored. So PEM files are base64 encoded text, text file, whereas PKCS are binary files. Very key, important difference. Then as I told you, PKCS 12 files can be password protected, right? And PEM files are not. So you can't password protect your PEM files, but you can password protect your PKCS 12 files, right? However, some software applications that use PEM files may require a password to protect the private key. File content. Now, uh, again, I told you that what can be stored in a PEM format or what can be stored in a uh, PKCS 12 files. So PEM files can contain different types of data. You can have certificates, you can have private keys, you can have CRLs, but PKCS has only two types, digital certificates and private keys. Always remember, PKCS 12 has only two things, digital certificates and uh, the private keys. Right? Platform support. Again, um, now uh, different types of um, formats are um, actually available on different kinds of platforms. So PEM files are commonly used. It, I, I'm using a term here commonly, right? So it is available, but uh, commonly used in Unix systems and PKCS 12 are widely used in Windows based systems. So wherever you will see a Windows based system, you will always see you will have PKCS 12 kind of files. And whenever you are working on Linux systems, Unix systems, you will always see that there will be uh, PEM files. So these are the PEM files where you would be storing your digital certificates. So now um, I have another uh, video after this, which will talk about the chain of trust. What is a chain of trust? Uh, it's just a kind of theory that you guys need to know what this term chain of trust means. We've already studied that um, in, in a demo I did earlier when we were talking about Facebook. But I just want to show you that, okay, what is a chain of trust? And then we'll actually move on to demos, interesting demos where we'll use OpenSSL to generate um, our uh, certificate signing request. We will sign those certificates. So all this stuff will will work on. So thanks for watching, guys. Okay, so in this video, we will talk about what is a chain of trust. So although again, we uh, already had a look at this, when we started the facebook.com certificates, I showed you that facebook.com was getting its uh, uh, request or the certificate signed by the intermediate CA and the intermediate CA was getting its request signed by the uh, root CA. So this is how a chain of trust is formed. And whenever anybody in, uh, in your organization is talking about the chain of trust, now you can easily imagine that this is the kind of chain of trust we are actually talking about, right? So let's take a look. So what is a chain of trust? So chain of trust is actually nothing but uh, I would say it's a sequence of events or interactions in which a trust is established and maintained between different entities. So as, as you can see, this is um, the, let's say the organization, it is requesting a certificate from the intermediate CA and the intermediate CA is then requesting from the top CA or the root CA. So it's a sequence of events, chain, as, as you know, a chain is being formed. So how do you form a chain? You join certain things, right? So this is how we say a chain is being formed. So a sequence of events or interactions in which a trust is established. The process of verifying the authenticity and integrity of digital certificates or public keys used for secure communication. It's, it's self-explanatory, I'd say. I, I won't go into more details of that because as you say, as you understand that as an organization, you are applying for the digital certificate and the RA or the CA is actually checking that are you an authentic person? Are you the real facebook.com? Are you the real cloudalchemy.com, right? So it, it ensures that you uh, the authenticity and integrity is maintained. The chain of trust is established by a hierarchy of CAs who issue and validate certificates for digital signatures. Very self-explanatory again. So what is the hierarchy of CAs? We have the intermediate CA and then we have the root CA. 
The top level CA is called the root CA, is responsible for issuing and signing its own certificate. Now, we already discussed that previously that root CA is the only CA that can issue a self-signed certificate because there is no issuer on top of a root CA, right? So each intermediate CA is authorized by the root CA. So always remember that you can't just simply go and uh, simply go to the intermediate CA. The root CA has delegated it to the intermediate CA. So the root CA has given the authority to the intermediate CA that yes, please go ahead, check this, um, the identity of that person and go ahead and issue the certificate for that, right? So an intermediate CA is authorized by the root CA to issue certificates. The trustworthiness of chain of trust depends on the security and reliability of root CA and its subordinate CAs. So what it says is how uh, this whole trust is, is formed is uh, due to the uh, security and reliability of root CA, how, how robust um, security mechanisms they are having, what kind of uh, encryption algorithms they are using. So it's very important uh, uh, for the trustworthiness of the chain of trust. And any compromise or breach of security in the chain of trust can disrupt the chain of trust. So if anybody goes and hacks this uh, into the intermediate CA, changes uh, some information here or changes some information here, it will actually break the chain of trust. So, uh, so the web browser can easily come to know that, yes, uh, somebody has gone in and changed something. And this is where they will say that it's an invalid certificate, right? So it's very important that this chain of trust is maintained all throughout the communication between the client and the server. So from now, uh, we'll start doing some nice demos. I, I know you guys have been waiting for these demos, but it's the it's, it's right time now. So I would uh, always advise that you can just simply um, go ahead and work with me when, when I'm doing the demos, you can do it on your systems as well. And it would be uh, quite, quite good for you as well. So thanks for watching. Finally come to start working and looking into the demo for digital certificates. Now, what we will use uh, here is we will be using OpenSSL, right? So we'll use OpenSSL to create uh, our certificates or create signing requests. And then we will sign those certificates. So we'll do it all what we have learned so far, but it would be done in a demo. So let's get started. OK, and I would advise that you can start working with me when, when I'm actually working on it. So you, you can just start working on it. OK, so first uh, thing says create a new directory. So we have to create a new directory called certificates. So let's say we create a certificates directory. We go into that certificates directory. Okay. OK, so I am in certificates directory now, right? So what it says next is I need to create a private key and I need to create a private key and a digital certificate, right? So what we will do is we'll just simply copy this and paste this. So you can do the same thing. But what we'll do is we'll go one by one. Let's let's take a look how it is done. So I'm saying open SSL is, is the command. We are generating a request. Now, this is as we studied the X509, X508 formats. So these are the digital certificate formats we are going to use. This would be my algorithm, which is uh, the, uh, the signature algorithm that I'll be using, which is SHA-256. Here I'm saying I need to create a new key. And when uh, obviously when you are creating a new pr pr private key, you need to tell which algorithm you need to use. So I'm saying, okay, I need to use an RSA algorithm and the key bits I'm keeping is 2048 bits. Uh, it says uh, for how long uh, you want to keep it. I'll say it expires after 65 days. The key out, I say CA private dot PEM, which means that this would be my CA's private key. So here I'm creating a root certificate. So this is my CA's private key. And the output is a CA cert dot PEM. Uh, now, uh, that's why we learned all these formats, the PEM format, the PKCS format. So I told you that if you're, you're, you're on Unix systems or Linux systems, you'd be using a PEM. Here I'm on a Mac system. If you're doing it on Windows, it, 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 could, it could be slightly different, but these things actually still work, right? So uh, the thing is that you can say uh, mi minus out CA underscore cert dot PEM. This will be the certificate that would be created. So if I hit enter, it actually asks me to enter the passphrase. So why is it asking me the passphrase? Because it's a private key you are uh, creating. So it says it's always good to protect your private key. So you're protecting your private key with a passphrase. So here the passphrase is Udemy. 
I'll give the passphrase Udemy. It says, okay, please verify it again so that I haven't entered something else. Okay, and then it starts asking me the information. So as we started the identity information, who are you? So you are creating the certificate, but who are you? Okay, so it says country name. I say country name is uh, say UK. The state or province name, I'll say England. You can change it as, as per what you, what you want to give. So uh, city, I say London. Organization name, I say my CA. So this is my CA. So I'm saying this is my organizational unit. Okay, so it says which organization unit are you creating the certificate for? I'll say, okay, I'm creating this for cybersecurity uh, because this is my CA and I should be able to sign it. And it says, okay, uh, common name uh, or the fully qualified uh, domain name, I'll say, okay, it is myca.com. Right, it asks for the email address. I'll say root at myca.com right perfect so here you'll see it creates two things one is the ca uh, underscore private uh, dot pem and um, the ca underscore cert dot pem this is my private key and this is my certificate so if i actually try and uh, try to read it okay so as i told you it is in base 64 format so this is in encrypted format you can't understand anything right or if i see the certificate if I try to see the certificate, the certificate also comes in this format. It shows begin certificate, end certificate. Now, um, if you really want to see the contents of certificate, there is definitely a way and I'll show you that. So the way to do that is we simply use the same open SSL command and try and give the request. So we're saying open SSL x509 minus in. Minus in is I'm giving the input as my certificate and I'm saying, Hey, can you, hey, open SSL, can you please show me the certificate in a text format? So if you see no out, no output, but minus text. Perfect. So here I can now read the contents of my certificate. This is a certificate that I've just created. So it shows certificate, data, version, uh, signature algorithm. Very important. You might remember I said we are using SHA-256 with RSA encryption. Issuer, just have a look. The things that I entered at that time, I said uh, UK, England, London, my CA, cybersecurity, everything what I entered is here. Even validity is there based on the 65 days I gave. So you can say it, it's, it, it can be used from this period to this period, right? And then you have the other information, right? Okay, my public key, the public key uh, bits, uh, how much was they? And the signature algorithm, which is SHA-256 encryption. Perfect. So this is what I wanted to show you that how you can, how a CA or a root CA can generate their own, uh, say, private key and generate uh, the, the digital certificate. Now, in the next video, what we'll do is we will, um, you, you can consider yourself like a web server, right? You are, let's say, working on a project and you want uh, to uh, create a certificate signing request, first of all, right? So you'll create a certificate and it will be a certificate signing request, which will actually go to the CA to get it signed. So we'll, we'll go step by step. So in the next video, we will uh, move and start creating a web server uh, certificate request. Thanks for watching. Okay, so another interesting demo is coming your way now. So in the previous demo, we saw how you can create or how a CA would create, it, create its own private key and also the certificate, the digital certificate or the root CA certificate. In this demo, we will see how if you are, let's say, coming up with a new application and you are setting up your new web server and you want a new certificate to be created for your web server, how would you, you would do that? The good thing is that what we learned in the previous demo is the same what we are going to apply here as well, right? So if you see, if I actually have to um, create this certificate, I'll just simply say the same command, open SSL request, SHA-256. So the, the, the only difference now is that in, when you were doing that root CA, you were giving open SSL and X50, X509, right? So here when, when we are doing it, we are saying open SSL request minus SHA-256. So there is, there is actually a difference in the commands, right? So please don't get confused. If I actually go back to, yeah. So if you say here, here we said open SSL request X509 and we gave the algorithm. So what, what are we doing here? We are saying open SSL request SHA-256 new key. Again, the same way we are saying we need to create a new private key. 
and we are giving the algorithm that it should be RSA with the key length of 2048. The key output is web server underscore private. So as I said, we are creating a web server private key. So web server underscore private dot pem and minus output is the certificate itself. And again, uh, to protect the um, uh, the private key, it, it has uh, to be protected by a password. So here I give you demi web. And again, I give you demi web. Okay, so it asks for the country name, I say UK, it says, uh, what is the uh, state or province, I say England, same way, it says you locality, I say London, organization name, okay, so here in organization name, I'll say cloud alchemy, because I'm generating it for cloud alchemy, organization unit, you can say I'm doing it for tutorials, right, common name or the fully qualified name, I can give my website name, like as cloud alchemy dot uk and email address i can give kvjoy at cloud alchemy dot uk and it says okay um can you enter uh, the extra attributes to be sent to the certificate request here i say yes ccur1ty okay and this is the x the the one that has created so here now we have the web server private key and we have the web server certificate Okay, so this is our certificate request that has been created, which is web server underscore cert underscore request dot pem. And the command that we, we will use to check the contents is different from the previous one that we learned. So it is open SSL request minus text minus no out minus verify minus in and you give the the actual name of the uh, the digital certificate and here you go so here you can see the certificate request this is a certificate request guys there, there is a difference right uh, so this is a csr that we have created so we will actually digitally sign this or it will be signed uh, uh, further by the ca uh, to, to to get the right digital certificate right so here, uh, rest of the things are uh, quite same what we uh, had input, like it is England, London, Cloud Alchemy, tutorials, and rest of the information is similar, like you have the public key, you have the, all the attributes and uh, whatever information we have kept, and also the, you know, the algorithms like SHA and RSA encryption. So uh, with this, we come to the end of the video. In next video, we will see how you can actually sign this request. So this is a CSR. This CSR will now go to the CA or the Certificate Authority and the Certificate Authority will sign this request. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. So time has finally come where we will take a CSR or the Certificate Signing Request and we will act as a CA itself and sign that certificate. And I'll show you how this can be done. So just to just as a flashback, uh, so this was the CA private uh, key that we had created. This is the CA cert or the CA certificate, uh, digital certificate that we had created. So normally uh, they would be different. So they, they would have different locations because CA would be somewhere different and your location would be somewhere different. It's just for the demo purposes, we have just kept one directory and kept uh, everything here just uh, for, for the ease of use. And this is the web server private key uh, that you created and this is the web server certificate that gets generated. It is actually the certificate request, always remember that. So let's Let's take a look how you can actually sign this uh, certificate. So to sign this certificate, the, the command that we have to use is we will say open SSL x509. So remember x509 is always used when you are creating either a self signed certificate or you are actually signing a certificate. Then we will use x509, right? So here we are saying open SSL x509 minus request minus in. What are we giving the input? We are giving the input as a certificate signing request, the CSR that we generated. And then on top of it, I always told you on the previous uh, demos, I told you that the CA signs the digital certificate using its own, any guesses? Yes, its own private key. So here you have to give the private key, which the CA will sign with. So that's why we are saying minus CA, CA underscore cert dot PEM, which is CA underscore cert dot PEM, uh, which is the uh, the CA itself, the the uh, the certificate itself, or the root certificate itself, 
and the CA key, which is the CA private key, the CA underscore private dot pem. And when we are creating it, we are just saying that please create a unique serial number as well for this. And the, the output should be a web server underscore cert dot pem. So just notice what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, uh, I will create a certificate that will be called web server underscore cert dot pem. So I'm just requesting, uh, removing this RAQ or the request out of it, right? So let's see how it goes. So it says, okay, signature is okay. Subject is um, UK, England, London, Cloud Alchemy. So it is. it means it is going to sign my CSR. So you remember when I created the CSR, I had created with Cloud Alchemy and tutorials. Now it says enter the passphrase for the CA uh, dot pem. So you might remember we had given this as Udemy, right? So we just give it, it is that quick. So it is already signed as well. So if you see, it has generated this web server underscore cert dot pem. Now, if again, uh, I try to check this, you will see that it gives begin certificate end certificate, which is in the base 64 format. We can't see anything. And another uh, important thing uh, to notice it, it actually generates a unique serial number as well. So if you see that this file gets generated, this is a unique serial number. And to actually see the contents, which are very interesting, we will actually use this command, which is again, open SSL of X509. So we will say open SSL X509 minus in web server underscore cert dot pem, which is the new uh, 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 this uh, certificate that has been created in text format. Perfect. So just have a look what we are getting now. So here you can see this is my signed certificate, right? So if you see uh, the this has actually been signed by my CA. Perfect, right? Can you see this? So this is my certificate. This is the signature algorithm, the issuer, who is the issuer? The issuer is my CA and who is it about? It is about cloud alchemy. If you see cloud alchemy tutorials, this was the request, which has been, if we go on top, signed by the issuer, which is London, uh, England, London and myca.com, right? Rest it's all pub public key information and the signature algorithm. So guys, this is also showing you this, the, the chain of trust that we talked about, right? So quite important demo, I would say you, you should always go and uh, do it on your uh, PC, on your laptop. It would be really amazing to go through these certificates and get real understanding of whatever we have learned. We've actually implemented those in demos. Thanks for watching.